Good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Grandview Heights Board of Education on October 7th, 2020 at 7.01 p.m. Um, just like our most recent board meetings, we are holding this meeting using video conferencing technology. As a reminder, the Ohio General Assembly and Attorney General have approved the use of virtual meetings as a viable alternative to conducting public hearings during this time and the district's alternative complies with these statutory directives. Um, we always have been uh, broadcasting these meetings via our Grandview Heights YouTube channel. The link is currently available on the district's website. The live stream of this meeting is being recorded and will be available on the district's website. Um, public participation at board meetings uh, will also occur. We ask that folks, just for future reference, uh, let us know by 5 p.m. The, the day of the meeting so that we can, on the technology, and get them set up. And I do believe we have some public participation uh, this evening. So, uh, call this meeting to order. Beth, please, please call the roll. Mr. Bodie? Present. Mrs. Gebhardt? Present. Mr. Gousset? Here. Mr. Truitt? Here. And Ms. Wasmuth? Thumbs up. We got it. Present. Um, let's, let's roll right into uh, recognition and presentation. Um, we have recognition of guests and hearing of the public right at the beginning. Um, the same rules apply as if we were in person. Uh, the board recognizes the value of public comment through governance. If you wish to address the board, you may speak now um, or directly before an action item that you'd like to address. A copy of the board policy is included in the meeting agenda that was posted online for your reference. When addressing the board, please state your name and address for the record, limit comments to five minutes or less, direct statements to the board, do not mention students and staff by name, and maintain reasonable decorum. The board will hear statements but will not answer questions or engage in debate during the board meeting. I as board president, uh, Andy Kalp is superintendent, Beth Collier is treasurer, or any other board members I'm sure are willing to meet with any member of the public to answer specific questions pertaining to Grand Heights City Schools. Um, Andy, Chris, we've got our public participation set up, I assume. Yes, we do. Haley, you want to call them off? Uh, yes, our first um, guest that would like to speak is Caroline Corbell. And I need to ask Ms. Corbell, um, can you hear me? Mrs. Corbell? I can hear you. I Great. So you have, you have the opportunity to speak now during public participation, or you can speak before or after the action item that you're interested in. Which do you choose? I guess we'll just go ahead and um, speak now. Okay. Um, and then, and then if I have, um, you know, then if I have a specific question after the action, yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and speak now. Mine is kind of um, general. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. go right ahead. All right. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you to everybody at the district um, for uh, always addressing uh, my family's questions about um, education in these times. Okay. Let me uh, get right to it. Could we, plan a public virtual forum on the pandemic and education so that our community has a constructive opportunity to come together, review the latest science, share perspectives and experiences, and envision the best path forward for Grandview. Given all that we now know regarding the coronavirus, and significantly all that we still do not know. Uh, today I sent the following email to seven staff of Franklin County Public Health. Dear FCPH epidemiologists, I'm preparing to give brief remarks during the public comments section of tonight's Board of Ed meeting for Grandview Heights, the district attended by my 10th grader. I understand that our district considers your recommendations for determining whether schools should be remote or in person. To that end, could you please clarify a few points? I know that into September, the FCPH worked remotely rather than at the office. Are you continuing to work remotely? And if not, when did you return to the office? What were your reasons for working remotely into September? And if applicable, what are your reasons for working remotely now? 
if previously FCPH included the City of Columbus data in its analysis of the coronavirus, when and why did FCPH move to exclude that data? Who specifically made the decision and who was consulted in the process? Does FCPH consider Columbus data in any way when guiding non-Columbus Franklin County schools to educate remotely versus in person? I have not as yet had a reply, nor have I had a reply to my attempts to uh, reach FCPH by phone. I was curious to learn, learn more about the policies of the school attended by the president's son, and to that end, called the school. It is St. Andrew's Episcopal School in Maryland um, in the DC suburbs and learned that uh, the school does plan to begin hybrid instruction soon. You can visit their web website to read about their um, policies. Required COVID testing for K-12 students and employees. It says on their site, in order for students to begin in-person instruction or participate in other campus activities after October 9th, they must first have a negative test for COVID-19. And then it goes on to say, after we implement the hybrid model, we anticipate providing and requiring testing every two weeks while school is in session. School employees have already begun testing and will continue to do so every two weeks as well. Again, that's the uh, policy of St. Andrew's Episcopal School in Maryland. I recently heard about the Global Teacher Status Index and wondered how the report, with the most recent one being from 2018, will be adapted to the specific circumstances of the coronavirus pandemic. In National Education Association news back in November 2018, Tim Walker published, Where Do Teachers Get the Most Respect? Uh, and he, he writes, it's not in the United States, according to a new global survey, but signs are everywhere in 2018 that the public believes US educators deserve better. And then he quotes the Global Teacher Status Index 2018. We find that there are major differences across countries in the ways way teachers are perceived by the public. This informs who decides to become a teacher in each country, how they are respected, and how they are financially rewarded. This affects the kind of job they do in teaching our children and ultimately how effective they are in getting the best from their pupils in, in terms of their learning. Um, and then Walker writes, the survey also found a clear correlation between the level of respect for teachers and the likelihood that parents encourage their children to enter the profession. Um, You've probably heard about Chad Dorrell, uh, the Appalachian uh, State College student. Chad Dorrell, this is from the New York Times, um, something uh, written by Sean Hubler, September 29th. Chad Dorrell was in tremendous shape, tall and slender, played basketball, ran long distances, but the 19-year-old college student died mon Monday. This was a, a week ago, last uh, in September, apparently of neurological complications related to COVID-19. And although the coronavirus targets the lungs foremost, it also attacks the kidneys, liver, and blood vessels. And a significant number of patients report neurological symptoms, including headaches, confusion, and delirium. Chad told his family that he was always careful to wear a mask. Uh, after his death, his mother posted to social media the following. As our family suffers this incredible loss, we want to remind people to wear a mask and quarantine if you test positive, even without symptoms. You have no idea who you can come into contact with that the virus affects differently. Chad was just incredibly tired for two weeks and little did we know it was secretly attacking his body in a way they have never seen before. The doctor said that Chad is the rarest one in 10 million case, but if it can happen to a super healthy 19 year old boy who doesn't smoke, vape, or do drugs, it can happen to anyone. And finally, um, from the uh, former CDC director to current CDC director, this is from USA Today, a former director of Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Public Health, Titan, who led the eradication of smallpox asked the embattled current CDC leader to expose the failed U.S. response to the coronavirus. 
calling on him to orchestrate his own firing to protect to protest White House interference. Um, his name's William Foge. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, but in any case, Foge, a renowned epidemiologist who served under uh, Democratic and Republican presidents, detailed in a private letter he sent last month to CDC Director Robert Redfield his alarm over how the agency has fallen in stature while the pandemic raged across America. Um, and then actually you can read the entire Foge letter to Redfield um, online. It is published at, uh, on Document Cloud. Um, if anybody's interested, I can give you the link. Um, but here's an excerpt and they are uh, on friendly terms with it, each other. They know each other well. Um, uh, the letter is addressed to, to Bob. You could send a letter to all CDC employees laying out the facts. You could set a course for how CDC would now lead the country if there was no political interference. Give them the ability to report such interference to a neutral ombudsman and assure them that you will defend their attempts to save this country. Don't shy away from the fact this has been an unacceptable tool on our country. It is a slaughter and not just a political dispute. In the United States, we're uh, around 210,000 um, COVID-19 deaths, but as we all know, the real numbers are um, significantly higher than that, uh, closer to 300,000. The pandemic is raging across the United States, and uh, we have a very fractured approach to how uh, it is addressed. And so for these, all of these reasons, and because the research is coming in, daily, uh, pretty much coming in from around the world, um, you know, by the hour. I really do think that our district, Ramby Heights, uh, should sponsor a public forum on the current state of the pandemic and education. Thank you so much for your time. If anybody has questions for me or would like my sources, uh, please do get in contact with me. Thank you very much for those well thought out comments. Um, do we have other public participation, Mr. Culp? I believe that there is one more that has signed up. Yes, Haley? Actually, no. Uh, our second um, participant decided not to speak. Um, our next guest um, will be a part of our OSBA Business Honor Roll presentation. Okay, well, very, thank you very much for that. Um, I know sometimes this beginning part of the meeting feels a little, a little disjointed, um, but uh, so we'll start with the OSBA uh, business honor roll presentation, and we'll have Mr. Culp take the lead on that on behalf of the board. Um, we'll get a construction update, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, COVID with some specific data to our district. So, Mr. Culp. The floor is thank you, Jesse. Appreciate that. On behalf of Grandview Heights Board of Education, we would like to congratulate and celebrate the following businesses that have been named to the Ohio School Board Association Business Honor Roll for 2020. These businesses are being recognized for the support of our students and our schools in Grandview Heights. Welcome to Maggie Neely from Gallagher Benefits. Since 2015, Gallagher Benefits has negotiated the district's premiums with health insurance carriers. Their aggressive negotiating tactics and strong bargaining power with insurers has led to favorable financial results for the district. Following a five-year period of 15% average annual premium increases, Gallagher successfully negotiated an overall reduction of 6.25% over the last four years without any plan changes for our employees. We are so very grateful for their partnership that we have had with Gallagher in our efforts to be good stewards of our community's tax dollars. Thank you. Additionally, welcome to Krista and Rick Lopez, owners of La to Tovala, Tavala, one of my wife and I's favorite restaurants on the planet Earth, by the way. In addition to owning and operating a fantastic restaurant, the Lopez's are ardent supporters of the Grandview Heights Schools from opening their doors for special community events to hosting sports team fundraisers. The restaurant is actually hosting a fundraiser for the cross country team today and tomorrow to providing foodstuffs for various Bobcat sports teams, such as the end of season boys soccer program banquet to program sponsorships. Rick and Krista always say 
yes to Grandview High School. So thank you so very, very much. Welcome to Megan Keating. Ever since Giant Eagle Grandview Yard Market District opened their doors on West 3rd Avenue, they have never failed to support the Grandview High Schools. Their in-kind donations are beyond kind. They have supported our sports teams by providing meals, spreads, donated desserts for senior nights, and box dinners for student spirit bus trips to events, as well as responded to numerous PTO requests. They also have a really nice gathering space where they can host on-site sports teams and school events. Thank you. Though Jay Kessler could not be with us tonight due to the previous commitment, we also want to recognize and celebrate Jay and Naughty Pine Brewing on this recognition. A favorite local watering hole brewery and restaurant, Naughty Pine Brewing has been a consistent supporter of our Bobcat student athletes through their scoreboard sponsorships. The Naughty Pine also offers pregame meals to our athletes before contests and is a fan of hiring our students for part-time work, an opportunity that helps our students build skill sets that will take them far part-time work, an opportunity that helps our students build skill sets, oh, sorry, into their future. So thank you to Naughty Pine and Jay. We want to let you all know that you will shortly be receiving your recognition certificates for placement in your business. So on behalf of the Board of Education, a heartfelt thank you to your inseparable partnership and success and uh, selfless donations to our district for and with our students. At this time, we would like to invite uh, Maggie Neely and Krista Lopez and Megan Keating um, to respond uh, or accept their awards. Would you like to go first, Maggie Neely? Thank you so much, Haley. And Andy and, and the board, I'd like to thank you so very much for this award. We're very honored. We thoroughly enjoy working with um, Beth and Jenny, um, the treasurer and assistant treasurer, and Andy and everyone at the district. Um, at this time, I also would like to share an award back to you. Um, I'm not sure if Beth had the opportunity to share um, this award. It was based on a national benchmarking survey that Jenny and Beth participated in. And Grandview Heights City School District, based on the, response, the responses submitted to the Arthur J. Gallagher Benchmarking Survey, has been awarded the Best of the Best in Class Award. And what does this mean? A best-in-class benchmarking analysis shifts the focus away from the average so employers gain perspectives on what it means to be the best. Over 4,000 private companies and public entities across the U.S. Um, participated. It is the largest um, benchmarking survey in the nation. Only 206 qualified for best in class for healthcare cost control, and then only 2% of the participants were awarded best of the best. So our congratulations to Grandview Heights City School District for being named best of the best on a, on a national basis. So it's a joy to work with you. It's great to work with a group um, such as yours. And really, um, you're, you're trying to, to maintain cost controls, relying less on plan design changes and more on removing waste from the system and equipping employees with cost transparency tools and second opinion options, you know, and sprinkling in wellness with it. So. Um, great job, everyone. It's a pleasure to work with all of you. And again, our team at Gallagher, Phyllis Nielsen, um, Heather Rusnick, Crystal Slicker, Paula Lindsay, Candy Clendenning, and I out of our Dublin office are just a pleasure to work with all of you. On a statewide basis, Cindy Sheppes leads, leads our practice, and our, our Ohio president is David Kempton. So again, we're all thoroughly honored, and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And thank congratulations, you. Beth, uh, that's uh, a big deal, so. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ms. Neely, and congratulations to Beth as well. Our next speaker, um, or recipient rather, would be um, Krista and Rick Lopez of La Tavola Restaurant. La Tavola Restaurant. Um, they must have uh, been called away. I know they're working tonight, but I know when I spoke with um, Mrs. Lopez, they were just tickled pink and thrilled to be recognized by OSBA. Um, our next um, recipient is Megan Keating on behalf of Giant Eagle at the Grandview Yard. 
Are you with us, Ms. Keating? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. This really means a lot. Um, I know we have missed doing events. I can't wait till we can have gatherings again and feed the boys basketball players and do everything we used to do. Um, but thank you on behalf of the store, our executive store leader, George Brown. Uh, we really appreciate it. Can't wait to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you. Unfortunately, Jay Kessler was not able to join us tonight. He had a, a prior engagement, um, but we also send out our congratulations to Naughty Pie Brewing. Excellent. So uh, I think that the next item on the agenda is uh, Jay Tadina and a construction update. So uh, Chris, can you bring Jay in? Jay, you should be uh, available now. Good evening. I, I, I think you can see and hear me. Um, again, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about construction. And uh, before I start with this month's update, you know, on behalf of the entire project, Haley, the rest of the schools, thank you so much for the cookies. They were, they were a major hit. They were gone within a half an hour. I think they were distributed amongst the field and you know, like we said before, you thought it was a little thing, but it's those things that make a big impact on, uh, you know, how, how we interact with the district and the community. So thanks, thanks again for that. Um, so yeah, the month of September was a, a, a very good month for construction. We accomplished a lot and uh, looking forward for, you know, all of the board and the rest of you to come out and see us and, and see what we've done. Um, but some of the things that we've done, in fact, just this week, we topped out our structural steel, which means that the last major member of the structure itself was, was set in place. And that's a huge milestone for the project. You know, over the next month or so, they'll be doing the little details of, you know, that are gonna be required for, for a safe structure, but it was a big deal. Um, you know, we impacted the community a lot this month as well, so you know, we appreciate the residents and, and how, and, and the parents and, and, this, and everyone that's put up with how we're plopping a school down in the middle of a residential area and then between the middle school and the high school. But um, we, we made a sanitary, our water connection out at Oakland, which had a shutdown on Oakland for a minute and made drop off and pick up with the hybrid model a little interesting. So thanks for your patient, but patience, but that's behind us. Um, We've completed to date eight out of 12 concrete pours. Um, so we're on the back end of that and um, we made six of them, I think this month. So again, it was a lot of concrete trucks going through. We wanted to make sure that we were safe, that the students were safe, parents were safe dropping off. And so again, thanks for your impact or for your patience with that. Um, so yeah, a lot of concrete going in. We've, we've by the end of, Next week, we'll have knocked out two out of the four masonry walls in the gym. Um, we're going to start putting in the exterior walls around the new middle school this month. Um, and if, if you could see inside the structure, we're already standing up walls. We're already running a lot of the piping systems and a lot of the mechanical and electrical systems. So even, even as much as you can see that's out there, there's even more going on. On, on top of the slabs that we just poured. Um, some cool things that'll be coming next month. Um, you know, in the next couple of weeks, we'll start to have our trusses that go over top of the classroom wings. Those will start to show up. And, and so you'll really see, you know, the honoring tradition of continuing on the sloped roofs around the classroom wings of the new middle school. Those will start to, you know, take shape and take place. Um, what else, you know, we're, we're preparing ourselves for the winter. It's coming, as you've seen this, you know, this, this evening was nice and we've had temperatures in the seventies today, but earlier you've seen it drop down in the forties. So we're preparing ourselves to, to carry on and stay productive throughout the winter months. So we're working on those activities. Um, 
we're working on our main new electrical service into the building coming up in a couple of weeks too. So you'll see a little more excavation out along Oakland, but it shouldn't impact, um, should not impact the walking path or Oakland from a, from a driving aspect. Um, as far as COVID goes, nothing new, nothing, um, we're, 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 we're still managing materials and, and making sure that our workers and our labor is productive and feel safe um, from that aspect. But a lot, a lot more to come and, and uh, we're gonna be busy from here on out. So that's an update for construction this month. Any questions from any of the board members? For today? Oh, we've got them here. Well, thank you, Jay. I'm probably one of the few people that uh, enjoy seeing that truck, concrete truck go up <laughs> in front of my house. Um, we, we're a little, you know, we're, we're a little tested. School, we enjoy it too. School, so. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Um, so, and then, uh, so next up, we actually have one of those neighbors uh, to the school that we've been impacting quite a bit. Andy, do you want to um, introduce Elizabeth for the CATS presentation? Uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Elizabeth Root is an epidemiologist with The Ohio State University, and I've had the distinct pleasure of getting to know her over the past six weeks uh, a lot better. We've been meeting on a weekly basis. We meet every Friday, and she gives me updates on uh, the CATS data, um, which is um, specific to our district boundaries. And I thought it prudent for her to share that uh, that data with the board and answer any and all questions. I envision this being a tool uh, in our toolbox in creating a framework for us to consider moving forward, uh, considering changing the pathways that we are in. Um, and so uh, Elizabeth brings to bear a tremendous knowledge base. Uh, you know, she is an expert in this field and also, as Jesse said, uh, has kids in the district and lives uh, on Fairview. Um, so she's been a tremendous neighbor. And so with that, I'll let uh, Elizabeth's capable hands take the lead here. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Can everybody hear me? Great. Yes, um, I, I am. I, work, I live on Fairview, so I can um, throw a rock and hit the school from my, um, my bedroom window, actually. Um, and I, I have not been as appreciative of the um, cement trucks, but that's, that's just totally, <laughs> I'm so glad the school's, um, the construction's moving so well despite that. I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, if I can figure out how to do it, there it is, share screen. Hopefully this works. So um, can everybody see my screen? Yes? Okay. So as Andy mentioned, I am, a, I am an epidemiologist. I am at um, the College of Public Health at OSU. I've also been working very closely with the Ohio Department of Health for the last six months. I'm actually embedded in the Ohio Department of Health to help them improve their surveillance activities using the data that's coming in from all of the different data structures. Um, and as part of that effort, one of the tools that, that my colleagues and I at, at Ohio State have created is what's called CATS. Um, which you can see in the presentation on the screen in front of you. And essentially what this is, is it's a tool for schools to use to be able to do their own surveillance of how COVID is affecting their and impacting their communities. And that's sort of the bottom line. I will say from the outset that it uses the exact same data that I use at the Ohio Department of Health every day to prepare my re reports and what Franklin County Public Health uses to prepare their reports to you. So it's the exact same information, it's just cut up and used in a different way that would be more useful for schools. So um, I'm gonna give you a really brief overview about what we hope CATS can do for our school districts. And then I'm gonna give you a bit of a, a demonstration of what we've built today and, and um, um, the data that we have for Grandview. So essentially CATS was intended to be part of a system that schools could use to make decisions about what learning mode or how they want to run their schools during the pandemic. And so this very first part uh, design, the, on the left-hand side is that we at Ohio State went through a design process for CATS. What kind of data do our schools need? How do they need to see it? Um, we talked with lots of superintendents across the state to try to get this information. Um, and from that, we then take the CATS tool to each individual district and we say, okay, 
what are the thresholds or the guidelines that you as a district would like to use to make decisions about what mode of learning you choose to be in? And so it's a process that happens between us, the researchers and the people at the Department of Health who know the data really well, and you who understand your district and your population and the ways that you can teach the children in those districts. Um, and from there, we basically to create this tool and hopefully some guidelines um, jointly, and you then can be, you, you then have a school-based response to the pandemic that's data-driven, but also acknowledges the nuances of your district. Grandview, of course, is very small, and so the ways that we do things are very different than Hilliard or Dublin or Upper Arlington or Bexley. Um, and so the system is made for that. So basically, what does it have? So from the Ohio Department of Health, there's a system called the Ohio Disease Reporting System. I'll refer to it as ODRS. And this is where all of the positive COVID cases get reported to the state. It's, um, COVID is a legally mandated reportable disease. And so everything goes into this one system. And from that, we can get COVID counts and rates. We can do it for different geographies, like just the um, Grandview School District. We can do it for the whole county. Um, we can also break it down by population, school-aged populations um, that are associated with our school because the, the ODRS data actually has age of the person who contracted COVID. From Grandview Heights, from our progress book data system, we also have the opportunity to grab um, student absences, excused absences for, F for illness, staff absences, um, and also our school nurse visit data. And we can look in that data to, to see if we have students that are coming in with symptoms that are, we call it CLI, it stands for COVID-like illness. So I want, these are the sources of data that CATS are, is currently pulling in. And just so you know, this is the same data that the state and the county are using, aside from the state and the county don't have your progress book data. So that's an added value. There's then a couple of ways that we can look at the data, right? So we can look at it at the Franklin County level. Right, so Franklin County has its own risk level. Um, it's not the same thing as what Franklin County Public Health has started calling a health jurisdiction. So Franklin County is, of course, the whole county. And it seems that Franklin County Public Health has chosen to cut that data up into smaller pieces that it's calling health districts. Um, and Andy and I struggled with this for a while to figure out what it was and what it meant and who we, Grandview, were being lumped with. I'm not sure we have full clarification on that yet. But what I'm going to show you is Franklin County as a whole, because I think we're embedded in that community and it's important to understand what's happening. We also can take our Grandview Heights School District attendance zone, so the boundaries of our attendance zone, and we can see what is the case rate in that attendance zone. zone. And also we can take the school indicators like student absences and all of that and look at it for our attendance zone. And then at the very bottom, we can actually look at some of these data by building as well. So you can say, okay, how many student absences do I have at Ellums? How many student absences do I have at Stevenson? So these are the levels that we can look at in the CAT system. So there's actually two versions of CATs and we haven't got, I mean, we've created them for Grandview, but we haven't done anything with them yet. So there is a public facing version and then there's a private secured version, what I'll call. I'm going to give you a couple of screenshots from the public version um, that, that you guys could choose to make public or not. And then I'm going to show, I'm going to actually take you to the secured version, which has a lot more data that could be used um, to make decisions. So the CATS um, public version is really stripped down. So basically you go to a website, it looks like this, it has some caveats at the top. Um, and, and what it has is a couple of different things. It has cases in Franklin County over the past two weeks. It has cases in the Grandview Heights City School District boundary, our attendance area, over the last couple of weeks. Um, and it kind of, and then it has a breakdown by age. And those are sort of the two big case related, uh, COVID case related data pieces that are on this website. The other thing that's there, and I'm gonna show you a screenshot because we just got the data from Meta who hosts Progress Book um, like yesterday. But what we can do is we can look at the number of student nurse visits due to COVID-like illness. And this actually looks at ours for Larson Middle School and Stevenson Elementary School. 
Um, and so you can see, you know, this last week, we've had quite a few students go in, um, three, well, I mean, three is a lot for us, wouldn't be in a big school district, but it's a lot for us. Um, so you can see, like, just yesterday, we had three nurse visits, um, several of them were in first grade, and um, one was in third grade, right down in Stevenson. So you can sort of track this. Um, and, you know, I, I've had some conversations with the school nurse about making sure that these data are put in really well so that we have another tool to track what's going on in our schools. But this is sort of the very first take of it. And then if you want to see what student absence data looks like, this is actually the student absence data that we pulled um, from Edison High School, Larson and Stevenson. And you can basically see how many kids are out um, um, and have an excused absence due to illness. And it's unspecified illness. It's not you did, you know, does your kid have COVID symptoms? It's just illness. The reason that this is really important is because the COVID case data that we get is often quite delayed. And so one of the things that we can do is try to figure out other data streams that are a little bit more timely for us to really understand what's going on in schools. So if we see a really big spike in student absences due to illness, it's not necessarily because we have COVID running rampant in our buildings, but it's an indicator that maybe we do have the beginnings of a COVID issue in some of our schools that we need to really be diligent and, and uh, about over the next week or so. And then that would then get confirmed by the case data um, that comes in from Franklin County. So this is a way of us being timely but also and by using the data that we have available to us as a school district. So that's sort of the, the basis of what's on the CATS tool um, for our school district. Um, I actually wanna go to the secured tool um, because this is what I think our school district you know, can use to really start making decisions. So this right here, this is actually hosted on the Ohio Supercomputer Center. Um, Andy, this is going to look a little different because this is version 2.0. It got updated today. Um, it looks kind of similar to what I showed you, but it has a lot more information on it. So here on the left, you can see we can monitor Franklin County as a whole, and we can see what the case rate looks like for the last two weeks. Note, I want everybody to understand that COVID data are delayed by at least a week. And so I'm showing you data that actually came in as of yesterday, here's October 6th, but know that we aren't really confident in the data until back, back about September 30th, because it takes a while for cases to get identified, for them to get tested, for them to come into the ODRS system and then get reported. So in reality, we're kind of back here somewhere in our understanding of what COVID looks like. You can also see that we can look at our school district, where our school district is right here, this little red blob kind of sandwiched between Upper Arlington and Hilliard and Columbus City Schools. And this sort of gives us the lay of the land in, a, in, um, in Franklin County in terms of our school districts. Um, I think of this in terms of, you know, my daughter played against Jones Middle School and soccer uh, last night, right? So um, clearly, I kind of want to know what's going on in that school district because our kids are interacting with those children. If you scroll down, whoops, I zoomed that out. If you scroll down a little bit, um, this is actually a chart that shows you our sort of two week running average of cases um, relative to the state, relative to Franklin County, and relative to all the other school districts in the area. So we're the black line, unfortunately. Our current case rate is quite a bit higher um, than many areas um, in Franklin County. And so you can see that reflected, we're right here. Um, and then this blue line is Franklin County and the green line is, is I think the state down here. Um, again, remember, this is I got a two week delay. So we're really only comfortable with the data back to about right here. Okay, we know there are gonna be some additional cases that roll in. So this is sort of how we can get a sense of how, how we sit relative to Franklin County. There's also a piece in here that allows us to directly look at our school district. So now what I'm showing is not all of the cases in Franklin County, I'm showing you just the cases um, normalized by the population that lives in the Grandview City School District, okay? So basically what we did is we took addresses of people who got COVID, we did something called geocodum, which puts them on a map, 
And then we took the Grandview Heights School District boundary and we basically said, okay, select out all those cases that happened in this area. And that's how we get this information. Um, and so you can see the little map that we used here to do that over on, on this side right here. So what this does is it shows us by age, right, how many children or, or adults have, um, have a COVID positive case, right, as, the, as a proportion of the whole. This is good because we can check to see if we know about all of these cases and that there's no unexplained cases that are popping up that we should know about. Um, it also shows us sort of when those cases were reported um, and it down below will sort of give us um, a sense of um, of what that looks like over time. So it's sort of doing the same thing that we did for Franklin County, but just for our school district. So we can we can really see how we're doing. Um, and then down below, this hasn't been populated yet, but this is the graphs I showed you. We'd have more information on our student absences, our staff absences, um, just like the charts that I so showed you in the, um, it, the static ones that I showed you. So this is uh, kind of the extent of the tool. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back to one more slide and then I will, um, I'm happy to answer any questions either about the data or the CATS tool. But the question is sort of what next, right? I just showed you a really great tool that has a lot of really important information and data in it. Um, it's complicated. You need to understand the data to understand what it's telling you. But what's the next thing? Um, well, typically what now would happen is that the you, the school district, would work with me and my colleagues at, at OSU. And we would help you answer a couple of different questions, right? How does your school district want to use CATS? Do you want to look at a daily report, a weekly report? Do you want to have somebody who's, who's in charge of looking at it every day, like Chris Dice there? You could do that for us, I think. Um, but really the goal is to develop a framework or some sort of a transparent set of guidelines which can assist the district um, on deciding when they want to pivot basically from one learning mode to another learning mode. So the question you could answer is, when do we move from hybrid to five day or when do we move from hybrid to a distance learning um, mode? Um, what sort of benchmarks do we want to hit? What sort of guidelines and framework do we want? Um, I'll, go, I'll show you something like a, a model for that. It's not populated in any way, but this is just sort of a really a blank slate. You could say we've got three modes. We've got full in-person, we've got hybrid, and we have full remote. And those are the three options that we have. And the question are using CATS or, and other information, if there's other information we have, what are the primary factors and thresholds for reaching um, sort of each goal learning mode? Like what do we need to be at? What do we need to see in the data? in order to say we're full in person, right? What do we need to see in the data to get alarmed enough that we say we need to take a break and we need to go to full remote? Um, and so that, that would be sort of the ultimate end goal of this system is to have something like this that the school could put into place. So I will leave it there. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions if folks have questions or clarify anything. Um, yeah, thanks. Well, if I could start and, and sort of suggest, uh, you know, a process for what we what we do moving forward now and, and certainly um, would, would appreciate feedback from Andy and the board, you know, I think um, we're, we're very fortunate, Elizabeth, to have you with us today. So I think maybe we should start by asking, you know, her specific questions that we want to know. And then, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in my mind, um, you know, <laughs> Andy, part of part of you know what you do for us as a board is take the feedback from the board uh, to develop what would potentially be a recommendation back to the board about what the system would look like so so i think what i'd like to do now if, if the board's amenable is is you know have discussion and ask questions with elizabeth then we could have some discussions to give andy some feedback and give him some marching orders to to continue to work to develop something to bring back with us. So to be very clear, and I, and I know we've got questions from, from folks in the community, how does this stuff, you know, how do these decisions get made? I mean, essentially, this is the point at which the, the board provides feedback to Andy, aside from Ace Mendo question questions here and there. So, so, you know, what we're not going to do today in my mind is, you know, determine exactly what that system looks like, but I think this oh. is the <laughs> To, to, to get that feedback. So if everybody's amenable, I'd, I'd like to start with that and, and open up the floor um, 
to, to, to ask questions based on the presentation we just saw. So um, maybe I could jump in. Um, Elizabeth, thanks again for this and, um, and, and the improvements. Uh, since the, the preview I, I saw before, um, I know you listened to some of the comments and um, saw <clears throat> the charts. I think they're, uh, I, I really love the chart comparing, um, you know, us to the other districts. And um, I think this is very helpful. So first of all, just thank you for all that. Um, as I had been looking at this before and coming again tonight, I think one of the things that I've, I'm struggling with that I think it would be helpful just to hear from you and your thoughts on this mm -hmm. is, you know, it's not like Grandview is this little hermetically sealed and we call it the Grandview bubble, but it's not. I mean, you talked about, you know, going to Jones and back and forth and I go to Kroger, which is, I don't know, I guess in Columbus and mm -hmm. go to work at OSU and, you know, all the, the back and forth, there's a lot of of course, you know, crossing of boundaries by a lot of people every day. And, and so when I look at like the Grandview only data um, and, and thinking about this in terms of like, what would be really concerned about? We would be concerned about, you know, if numbers go up, that would mean that there is a danger of spreading and uh, a higher likelihood that it'd be good for us to, you know, have uh, reduce the number of contacts and maybe have fewer kids or no kids in school and all that. Um, and, and thinking about the Grandview schools as, you know, the kids come from here, but the teachers come from different places. So I guess I, I, I struggle a bit with thinking of like, let's just look at the Grandview numbers, which is in some way great, but in some way it seems kind of artificial just to gr draw those boundaries and say, oh yeah, if we saw a high number for Grandview, or a high number for Hilliard and low number for Grandview or whatever it else, um, that that would be, you know, tell the whole story. Right. And so I'm wondering if like, are, should we just, I mean, is there, does that really make sense to look at the Grandview or does it make sense to look at Grandview and Franklin County or Grandview and a 10 mile radius or like kind of what are your thoughts about us, you know, using that, those different levels of data? Yeah, that's a great question um, because disease doesn't know boundaries, right? There's clearly not a stopping of disease on Third Avenue on the other side of my house. Um, I can walk over there. I think that it's important to understand both. I agree that we are not in a Grandview bubble. Many of our parents and our, as you said, our staff go to work in a different place than where they live. And so there's a chance of bringing things back. So I, I think that it's important to look at Franklin County to understand how at risk our community as a whole is. And that's why I would advocate that if you were to set sort of a guidelines thresholds for this framework, that one of those guidelines be Franklin County's numbers, right? What does Franklin County look like? At the same time, what I think is very useful from, the, um, from just the Grandview Heights School District level is really that age breakdown piece, right? Where are we seeing, it, in sort of population demographics, where are we seeing infection right now? Um, is, it, is it among kids or is it among, you know, older people? Not that we don't interact, older folks and, and our children, but it does give us a sense of whether or not it's really in our children's population, in the children's population in Grandview, and we should be really concerned about children particularly interacting in a, in a specific setting. So I think the combination of the two are, are very important. And I would guide you to create thresh, like sort of benchmarks or thresholds or some sort of um, design where you have both, right? You have, you've selected uh, several different indicators that you're gonna look at. Going along with that, kind of following off of what Eric was discussing. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for putting together that presentation. I think that's, that's great. Um, and actually, before I ask my, my second question, uh, moving forward and having an expert in the district, um, one question that I'll ask, and I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot or not, but um, how much would you be willing to uh, work with the district in terms of, you know, analyzing the data and coming up with decisions? Right. Oh, I'm happy to. So um, 
It's, um, I won't, I'm part of a team at OSU, so I'd probably, it would probably be me, what, me and one other faculty member, but I would, I've already told the fa other faculty members that I would be willing to take on um, Grandview County as my school district, so that I would guide through this process and help um, analyze the data and look at it. So I am more than happy to serve our community in that way. I appreciate that. Um, and then my, my second question, uh, with having such a small, you know, end for our population, I yeah. imagine that a, a case increase of a few is going to have an enormous effect. Yeah. Um, so going to Eric's point of using countywide data, and I, I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to kind of underscore, it's kind of scary to see how much our district is above the other districts, but it's, you know, a couple of cases is going to enormously affect us. Mm -hmm. and we have a couple of less cases, we could be way below. I mean, I think our numbers are going to kind of jump all over the place because of our small size. Yeah. Yes, yes, that is true. Um, small numbers are always a problem um, for creating rates. Um, I will say that we have used some techniques. So I put on my um, community-based hat right now to work with you, but I actually do, um, I'm a statistician. I do biostatistics. And so we've used a couple of methods for smoothing these data um, or averaging out the noise that you get that bouncing around because of small rates. And one of them is that we're not just considering one day of data when we create a rate, we're thinking about a whole two weeks worth of data. So you're right, it's gonna bounce around and it's gonna bounce around more for us in our school district than it is in a much larger school district. But at the same time, I think the challenge is that we are really surrounded, right, by Columbus. And so the, the, the chances of introduction of disease into our little Grandview bubble, which isn't a bubble, is really a lot higher than some of these other communities. You know, you think about Hilliard, you think about Dublin, there's like farmland in half of that district and certainly all the way on the other side. We don't have that opportunity. And so I think we're probably a higher risk district in general because of our situation within the Columbus system, right? Um, but I, I assure you, I do hear that. And I think we need to consider that, of course, when we're creating these framework, we need to say, okay, it's not one week of numbers are gonna set us off. We really need to see two weeks of numbers to make sure that it wasn't a blip, right? It was, it was actually a trend. Um, and we might need a little longer lead time to make sure of that. So one more, one more comment, sorry. So yep. go, going off of um, the governor's recent comments uh, of, of case rates increasing towards the West and in more rural settings, do you think that um, we stand to see, you know, are you more concerned about the density of Columbus being surrounded by just, just a denser population rather than rural areas? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, density is one of the biggest drivers of COVID right now. Um, our, our cities traditionally have done poorly. Ohio is strange right now. Um, we're actually seeing our rural areas continue this sort of upward march in their case rates with almost unabated. And it's a lot to do with non-compliance with mask orders and all the other social distancing and whatnot. The rural areas are just not as compliant. And I've, I'm working on a survey that actually shows that. Um, right now in Ohio. On the flip side, um, Franklin County has always, through this entire pandemic so far, been by far orders of magnitude higher than our other urban areas in terms of case rates. Not entirely sure why it's not totally driven by the OSU student population because they weren't here in the summer, but for some reason, Franklin County doesn't have it under control in the same way that our other urban centers in the state does. So we're also at higher risk because of that. So one question I had, and, and this is more just curiosity, but, mm -hmm. and, and I certainly understand everything we're saying, but I, you know, I, I think the perception would be, and, and I think people are a little bit surprised that the case rate is as high as it is. I, I think people that are just, you know, from a sense, you know, well-educated people think we're doing better than that. So it's easy to jump to, well, you know, the small numbers make us jump up and down. I mean, there, there's legitimacy to that, but it's also, you know, right, the truth is the case, the case numbers are, are high right now. And so, you know, I, I feel very, very lucky to have you, Elizabeth, and us as a school district having understanding of this. Do our city leaders 
have the same data and information? Because, you know, I, I would imagine there could potentially be, whether it be from just an educational component all the way to, you know, orders from the city council or mayor's office that help to help fight this, you know, community wide, you know, like, yeah, we're in a bubble, but or we're not in a bubble, but, you know, try to limit that or all the things that we hear that, that some other places are doing. And right. so you know, I, I would say, um, you know, the, this school board and this administration has had a good history of, of partnering with the city on things. And I'm not sure that we've really done that this much in, in this realm. I mean, you know, I'm not hearing advice yeah. about not having play dates or not doing, you know, it's almost like people are scared as a school district and, and, and politicians to make those, make those things. I mean, you, you know, doctors and scientists like you are getting threats for sharing data. Yes. So Andy knows my opinion on this. Um, so I, as you know, I've, I, I, I have been working with the Ohio Department of Health. Like I've been embedded in the department. I am very, very aware of the politics that are going on right now with this. I'm sure. And what I've seen is that there is a hesitancy all the way from the top to make strong, not recommendations, but like mandate things, right? To mandate ways of being, to mandate certain types of decisions all the way from the state level. And everybody keeps passing the buck downwards, right? So the state has basically passed it off to the locals, the local health departments. Who, who many of them have basically passed the buck down to anybody else who has to make decisions. And unfortunately, it means that school districts, you are having to make your own decisions about a lot of these things. That's not your job. You should never have been put in a position to do that, right? And so you're right. There is a lack of really clear guidelines and, and recommendations around exactly what and you should and shouldn't do. Um, I don't think it's just here. I think it's actually across our state. I think it's across the United States. What does that mean for you? <laughs> it means that unfortunately, you probably need help from people like me, right? Or other of my colleagues at the College of Public Health to start thinking about what are the decisions that I have to make about kids and how are we gonna make them? And fortunately, because of CATS, you have the data to do it at least. And then you need to figure out what that means for your school district. But I have to tell you, I find it frustrating. Exactly what you're saying. I find it. I'm looking at this, and, and, may, and I don't mean to, to divert us too much. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, we're here to talk about the school district and our kids. But, you know, if, if we have the highest case rate in the county, right. and Franklin County has been one of the worst in the state, I mean, you, you know, you, you put all that together, like, yeah. you know, how do we band I, together as a community? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think this would be a focus of city government in both Marble Cliff and, and Grandview Heights you know, yeah. number one agenda also. Yeah, I think, you know, my feeling on the matter is that um, very early on the pandemic, we were terrified that we were going to collapse our public health system, right? Hospitals weren't going to handle it. We were setting up the convention center to handle patients. And what it turns out is that our hospital system can handle it, right? And is doing a remarkable job of handling it. But what it did was it de-emphasized community transmission. It made it like all focus on the health system and it de-emphasized our understanding of community transmission. And what I'm finding right now as somebody who um, communicates data, right, that's part of what I do. I try to communicate what the data is saying is that people don't understand that we are at a very high level of community risk right now, right? Franklin County is not doing well by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so that people don't get that. Right, like people just don't quite understand that. Um, and I, it's frustrating and I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> but our case rate, like in Franklin County is like on par with third world countries that have no public health system, right? And I don't think people understand that, that, that right there. We're not doing well. <laughs> well, I mean, the reality from a school district standpoint, you know, um, Sometimes it's healthy and sometimes it's not. And in, in different realms, I know Eric and I have debated this when we, when we do county comparisons and compare it to all the districts. I mean, you, you know, we're, we're sort of conditioned to do that, whether it be with student testing data or, or anything, really, tax, right. whatever it is. And, um, but, 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 you know, we also know that a lot of our neighboring districts are, are looking at and exploring the idea of, of going back full time and, and you mm -hmm. know, 
you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're almost like, hey, right now we're in a matter of, you know, do right. we stay hybrid or go back to a break? Is sort of just the rea our reality, our right? Reality. Now. Yeah, Not I think. I about. think what really has challenged me, and I again, I had a conversation with Andy about this, is we are doing okay in our school district, right? I wouldn't necessarily recommend we stop hybrid. We we don't. Our system is working. We've had a few cases. We've managed um, to to socially distance our children in school well enough that that hasn't gone anywhere, right? We've identified those cases and they haven't seemed to lead to more cases. That's good, right? But we're doing that with all of the public health restrictions we have in our schools going on, right? Which is not normal. And so great, let's keep it at this. We're doing okay, we're managing it. And what a lot of school districts seems to be doing right now, as soon as you get to that point where we're handling it, they're like, oh, we can go back to normal. Right. Oh, we can back, go back to the five day, you know, decision. And the answer is no. The only reason you're doing OK is because you're in this hybrid model. Right. Where, where, where we've controlled the situation so that we can keep it where we are. Um, I'll tell you, I expect fully that the districts that go back to a five day will start to see problems probably in two to three weeks. That seems to be the cycle we're seeing in the data for when things start to like change after you've made a change to the structure of the system. Um, so it won't be immediate, but it will happen. Um, and then they'll have to make the decision whether or not to flip flop again, right? <laughs> well, I mean, so, yeah. can, can I, I'm, I'm sorry, Jesse, can I follow up on that exact point? Because I, I was thinking of this. Um, this is just a really important message you got here. Yeah. Um, I mean, one fascinating thing about Ohio is that um, more or less, I think we started out the year as a third, a third, a third in school districts that were either you know, fully regular or hybrid or fully mm -hmm. online, at least populations, maybe not number of school districts, but total population of the kids. And, um, you know, as crazy as that is, you talked about, you know, putting the, the decisions at the lowest level and having people fend to, for themselves. Um, it, it does create kind of an interesting experimentation phase. And I mean, you just talked about kind of your predictions of what could happen when, when school districts change. I'm wondering if you could talk about what you've learned in tracking or mm -hmm. hearing things, you know, on this, what is it now, you know, a month and a half that we've um, had school back in, in session in Ohio. Um, has that given us anything where, you know, you would look at numbers now differently than you did, um, you know, two months ago? Um, or is it still just too early to tell? And so you're basically, you know, your still mess message is still, you know, let's be careful about it and keep doing what you're doing. That is a, that you just asked like the $10 million question. Um, <laughs> we are, I'm actually, part, one of the things my research team at OSU is doing is, is looking at case rates um, for school districts in different, in different models. Um, so we actually are doing that analysis right now. Um, most of our school districts delayed actually. And so we only have maybe four weeks of data right now. So it's really too early to see. Um, Indiana went back an entire month before we did and we're looking at their data as well. So far, what I can tell you is that the rural districts um, that have really sparse populations, it's, it seems to be fine if they go back full five day in person. Um, they don't seem it's I think it's just there's the student population is so small that they 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 can handle it. It's not and and the disease transmission is just lower in rural areas. I mean, there's less disease circulating because there's less people. Right. So um, that's not to say it's not a problem in rural areas. The problem with understanding what's going on is all of our major urban districts basically opened in distance learning. Right. Um, and so we didn't see any effect on case rates at all during that period, right? So Columbus City Schools hasn't even gone back. They're gonna be probably distanced through this year would be my guess. So we don't actually have a lot of information about what happens when a large urban school district goes back full in person or even really hybrid. Um, although you could say, you know, our, our, our suburban school districts are hybrid. Um, we have already seen some outbreaks in like Hilliard, 
from their hybrid system. So I, I do know that they've seen some, some things happen, especially in their elementary schools, which makes sense because those children are less likely to adhere to all of the guidelines because goodness Christ, they're, they're six, right? <laughs> How do you tell them to wear a mask all day? Um, and so I think that's a challenge. The other thing that I think Randview did that was smart, although I know it's created a lot of challenges, is that the half day thing really may help us in the end because you're not telling a child they have to wear a mask for six hours. You're telling them they have to wear a mask for three hours. That is doable for our children if we constantly remind them to do it properly. Wearing a mask for six hours a day, I mean, I can barely do it and I have to do it when I'm at work. I, I mean, I'm constantly itching, scratch. I mean, I know I'm doing stuff I'm not supposed to do. So the, so the issue, Eric, is that not only it wasn't just that we did hybrid distance full online, the hybrid models are all different across the state. Um, so it's really, really hard to tell. What I have seen from the data though, is that this is not, we are not in an equilibrium state, right? Like we are not at a constant rate of COVID. There's not like a flat line that we're at. Any minor change to the structure of what we're doing totally changes the epidemic curve, right? So, we went back, you know, the uh, governor opened all businesses in May, it, May 1st. It took three weeks, but then we had that massive spike in July, right? Slaps on a mask order, right? The mask order brings that back down again. All the universities open, we disturbed that equilibrium. We saw a spike again in cases, right? And then the universities, notably OSU, started doing massive scale testing and contact tracing. We made a change to the system. It came back down again. Schools open, kids go back five days a week. You can't tell me that we're not gonna see a spike in cases again, right? Because you've disturbed this system that we have set up right now that's keeping us where we're at. It's really complicated. Like I've never worked on something so complicated in my entire career. <laughs> And I don't know, Elizabeth, this is really a question for you. You know, I, I, I you know, there's so many data and my, my mind is trying to, you know, probably oversimplify <laughs> um, a, a metric, but it, but it seems to me, and I appreciate your comments about, you know, we've gone back in this hybrid and seem to manage it well, because, you know, from my non-medical opinion, it has certainly seemed that way. I mean, we've had positive cases, which are unfortunate, but we haven't been sending classrooms home or grade levels home. Right. Uh, and a lot of that, I think, comes down to the, the contract tracing rule of six foot in 15 minutes. And, um, you know, I understand there's definitely differences with a mask a full day and a half day. But, you know, we can look at the case rate data all day long, whether we're worse than the county or better than the county or worse than the state and better than county. But at the end of the day, you know, if at a certain point in time, soon or far away, we go back and put every kid in the building, the six foot goes away. Yep, absolutely. You know what I mean? And because it seems like we're managing it very well with the six foot, that's, that's where I have a challenge. And I would also, now this is a back of the envelope calculation, and, I, and I've shared this with, with Andy, you know, as other school districts go back, I, I think we as a, a body may get some pressure from, from some folks. And I'd like to use the new Albany example. And this is, this is back of the envelope calculation. So this, this you know, looking at third grade, um, you know, my third grader's classroom is 580, 590 square feet. A new Albany classroom is around 900. 30% of their kids are going uh, full virtual. Our percent's less than that. So for that grade level, when I just did this real quick, when New Albany is fully back in, a third grade student has two or three more square feet in the room than we do in hybrid. So I worry about those comparisons, and I don't know how much the study that you're doing of the different models really takes that into effect because I would make the argument from a from a contract tracing standpoint our hybrid is equivalent to New Albany's all in. And it may be. Um, I think that the fact that a good chunk of New Albany student population chose to go full distance right of their own volition right that was their choice because they were uncomfortable with the idea of their children being in like a third of your district, that's insane, right? So it's true, they may not have a huge spike, 
Um, it's hard for me to believe that we won't see some movement in some of those numbers, partially because being in a classroom for six hours or every day where you have to keep a mask on, I just really believe that that's difficult. Um, and there's two things that contribute to transmission. One is distance, but the other is time, right? The more time you spend in a concentrated space with somebody that has COVID, the more likely you are to get it. And it doesn't matter if you're wearing a mask, you're just more likely to get it. There's a higher probability. And so that's now five days a week, six hours a day, right? And that's, I mean, that just exponentially increases your, your exposure time is what we call it in, <laughs> in the biz. Um, but I agree, it's not good. That's why I said it's really complicated and it's messy and it's the hardest thing I've ever worked on because all of these things matter. <laughs> and it's, it's hard to take account of all of them, even in all the wonderful modeling we do. Can I just ask a very specific question? When you're getting um, the number of cases to determine by zip code, does that come from where people report their residence is? As, Okay, I assumed as much, but I know that that's a question that people have that comes up, you know, occasionally. Yeah, no, that um, the case data is all done by residential address. So it's not even zip code, we have the actual address. The confusion is often with the positivity data that's getting talked about. So percent positive cases that are identified from testing. That data has had some real problems about where it's being attributed to a patient address residents or the hospital that they visited to get their test. Um, so the positivity data is a mess. You noticed I didn't show that to you here because it's a total mess in our state. Um, but this data is, very, is, is as good as it gets for data, frankly. And to sort of um, piggyback on what Jesse and Eric and maybe some others have said, I think um, presently right now, I'm less concerned about how we move out of where we are forward and more so about the notion that we would move backwards um, to a distance learning based upon data that we're seeing for our school district. Um, because the data for the for the district, like as in what we're seeing from our from our reported number of students who are having to quarantine or student or active cases in the district is so low that I think that the district as a whole would have a hard time swallowing the idea of moving backwards to distance learning when, when so far what we've seen by and large has been success at keeping it out of the schools. Yep. So, I mean, that's, can you speak to that or what your impression yeah. of that is? So, yes, I mean, we have been successful. I, I, for the last three weeks, I've told Andy, stay the course, we're doing well. Like things aren't getting worse, they're not really getting better, <laughs> but they're not getting worse and we're managing it well. Um, I would say that in, when you think about sort of the framework or the guidelines that we might develop um, for the district moving forward, that um, some of the guidelines don't just have to be about this data that I showed you, some of those guidelines would, should be about how many cases have we identified in our school district and did they lead to other cases, right? I would also say that you don't have to create a district-wide framework. You could say, we have a problem in Stevenson. We need to take a break in Stevenson and that school, we need to pull into a distance learning program for two weeks to sort of flush out the system, right? So I think there's different ways that we can do it. And I, as I said, as Andy has said, we haven't come up with that framework yet. Um, but those are some recommendations that I might have. One of the big measures that's gonna come online with the new Ohio Public Health Alert System, which I've been working on, is they're going to actually create a new measure that's the number of outbreak or number of cases or proportion of cases that come from known cases. That's a real, um, that's a real indicator of how well you're doing. So if you have a bunch of cases and you have no idea where they got sick from, that's a real problem. If every single one of your cases that you identify in your school district has a known source of infection that you can track down, you're doing a good job and there's no reason to necessarily change what you're doing. And that's what I, one of the things I think we should look at in our district because we are so small and we can do that. 
That actually leads to another question I was going to ask, and I'm not sure if you can answer this, Dr. Rue, but maybe Andy can. Um, but that that data you had about like nurse visits or when students are absent for what I mean, given that the numbers are relatively small overall, you're talking like three to six kids per building absent on any given day. When someone calls in sick, what does our school district do to follow up with that family to see why are you not here? Because just in case somebody's not reporting something that might be COVID, you know, how are we finding that out? Yes, yeah, so we do follow up with any student that's absent. Um, we, we do ask um, the reason. Now, we can't require that they tell us that it's because my son or daughter is COVID positive. However, you know, one would think that in these times, following the honor system and doing what's right, they would. Um, so we do have a personal conversation in each of those instances, um, and we do try and track that accordingly. You know, but but one of the things that I, I don't know that this is specifically what you you're asking either, but I, I will say. Um, one of the other conversations and Elizabeth uh, mentioned this earlier is um, this idea of what necessitates or warrants uh, a clinician or a nurse tracking a nurse visit. Um, you know, in, in terms of for this dashboard. And, and so either it needs to be all like, so for example, if you cut your thumb, should that be part of this dashboard? Um, you know, in, in other words, either you need to report it all, no matter what the visit is for, or conversely, it needs to be for, uh, what was your acronym CLS, COVID related? CLI. C oh, thank you, C CLI. Um, so, you know, it, it, in other words, we, we as an organization need to have quality data in terms of the consistency with which each clinician is reporting that. And, um, you know, so th those are some of the questions that I've asked our nurse to get clarity on. And, and we'll, we'll work that out with Elizabeth. And either way is, I think, fine, but I think we need to know. Um, so, Andy, so I think that's maybe a good segue into um, a another thing, which is um, just thinking about uh, the data and availability. Um, I, I, I appreciate Dr. Root, uh, you know, the presenting it as, you know, here's something that could be likely public facing. Um, and uh, so, you know, it sounds like, you know, at the start of it, we have a good suggestion there to go off, but we also have some decisions to make. Mm -hmm. my, my sense is, you know, that it's a developing tool. It's one that, you know, you're building it as you go along. And uh, just from a technical thing, you know, there's, there's that. Um, something that you just talked about, Andy, you know, was the um, uh, making sure we have a good system in place for getting the data and making it consistent. And, you know, there's um, uh, miscommunication that can happen. You know, if you don't have a well thought out system, you start throwing numbers out there and then you're like, oh, well, we just learned something. And so, you know, you have to change it. And then that's just really confusing. So I guess, you know, trying to find that right spot between, um, you know, putting something out there before it's ready, but also not wanting to wait too long. So, um, you know, it sounds like we're getting there. Um, I mean, I definitely think I wouldn't be the only one saying, you know, we ought to share some of the data with the public. I mean, it's helpful for people making their own decisions. And, and I think it's just wonderful to have data. Um, you know, and some of this like real time data and some that's, you know, a week old, but, you know, great to be able to have that to, to have a, um, uh, you know, an, an informed conversation and, and be able to track things. So um, anyway, I, you know, I would certainly be in favor of sharing some of it, but I, I guess really kind of the question is, you know, when would we be, when would you have a, a uh, um, you know, what are you thinking about a timeline for, right. for when this would be ripe enough to, to put out in a public setting? Sure. So the, so the, so the, the Ohio State team knew that some of our school districts would want to be able to share something with the population, right, with your, with their constituency. And so the, the first thing they did actually was create the public facing app. And Andy, I don't know if anybody saw it except for you. 
Um, but it's it's really stripped down, right? It's much more it's much more simple. Shouldn't stimulate quite as many questions, but it's it's a lot more stripped down. It depends on what you as a school district want to put on that, because we've created sort of a beta version that has what we think might be useful. But the next step would be to say, okay, what would you as a school district like to publish on it? Strip it down to that, and then you could release to the public. I think a, a week or two, right? Honestly, we, we just got the school district's um, absentee data in. And if that is something that we want to look at on that public website, we still need to do a little work on it. Um, partially because one of the things we do is we, we don't want to just say, oh, five kids are absent. We want to say, oh, five kids are absent. And that's totally different than last year this time. And so we need to actually do a little work on the data to figure out what the norm was for this time of year before we can actually make it useful information for the public. Um, sort of what you're getting to, Emily, like three kids a day, who cares, right? But if it spikes to 10 kids a day, and that's five more than we would have seen this time of year last year, then, then we probably do have a bit of an issue we need to be worried about. Um, so I don't think too much longer for the public facing app. And, and um, it just depends on what you, what we as a school district decide we'd like parents and community members to be able to see off of that. Because the data use agreements are all signed. We have permission from Franklin County Public Health. Like all of those hurdles have been overcome by the OSU team. It's now just a matter of you as a community deciding what's best for you. So I think, uh, you know, Elizabeth and I have the good fortune. She's been so gracious with her time. Let the leadership team and I work, continue to work with her to build a framework and, and you know, um, I'll continue to share uh, via Google Docs or um, individually individual conversations and garner feedback from the board about what their thoughts are so that we can work together to establish um, criteria and a framework. I think, um, you know, a, analogous to when, it seems like a year ago, but I think it was three months ago, <laughs> when we were creating the initial framework you know, I, I do think that a framework in having data is super helpful, and this is another tool in our toolbox. I also think that having a caveat of our being able to make decisions that are specific and best for kids and, and our district is also important. You know, for example, um, you know, I'll, I'll pick on Stevenson for fun. You know, it could be that there is an outbreak at Stevenson that 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 doesn't as a district rise to a level of our established framework. However, we need to uh, mm -hmm. either a class or a building at Stevenson uh, make some decisions. And I think having that latitude and discretion is also important. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I frameworks are important, but frameworks don't have to be, I mean, some, they don't have to be hard, right? They don't have to, they can have flexibility within the framework. So you can say, you know, to be in this level, we want something that looks like within this range, right? So it gives you the flexibility to say, right, rather than having a number, you can yeah. have a range and yeah. you can say, we'll consider it when we're in this range. And yeah. that allows you the latitude, but still provides transparency. Yes. Parents and community members who want to see that you have, uh, basically want to see that you have hard numbers, right? That you have a decision support there. Um, right. So there is a way of being in between, I think. Exactly. Yep. Because the thing we parents hate the most, of course, is uncertainty. We want to know what the plan is, don't we? That's what we keep. <laughs> yeah. right. So parenthood is uncertainty, right? <laughs> so, uh, it's just a big bag of uncertainty all the time. <laughs> but, I, I mean, what you're saying is getting to exactly like some conversations I've had with Andy is like, if you set something like 50 per 100,000 as a target for Grandview, well, that could be one family for Grandview because of right. our small size. So like one family goes away to another state to like a family wedding and then they all get it. And like that one family causes Grandview to go to a different mode, you know, like that doesn't make sense. So that ability to, you know, not have, you have targets, but like the ability to humanize it and realize that not everything fits within that. And my understanding is correct uh, that part of what you're able to do with this data is if you see a lot of, um, you know, six to 17, 18 year old cases that don't match what we're seeing in the district. Yes. I mean, we, we, we know that's an issue. And, and, and realistically, not every kid in that age group 
in our district goes to our school district. I mean, there are there are some choices by families to do other things, but um, but you know, yeah. it's good to know that we get that disconnect. Um, you'd like to think that wouldn't happen here, but you hear about people sort of trying to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> keep that stuff private so a kid can still play on a football team or whatever. You know, you know there, there is that. There, and there's stigma. We're starting to see a lot of stigma around being COVID positive and that never helps either. So, you know, I, I personally believe people have good intentions, but sometimes those good intentions, especially when your children get thrown into the mix, um, become slightly more selfish intentions. And I get that as a parent. Um, but I think the combination, Jesse, of the different levels of looking at the data, of being able to look at our school district, the county, um, student absences, right? The co this is sort of the thing in data science right now. One number doesn't tell you the story. But right. the combination of all of those numbers put into a framework for us to understand them is really going to help us make the decisions that we need to make. Thank you so much. Well, Elizabeth, unless there are more questions, just on behalf of the Board of Education, I can't thank you enough. And uh, again, I, I uh, as the superintendent, we are so fortunate to have you in our community. And it has been a true pleasure getting to know you over the last six weeks. And I look forward to working with you and am thankful that you're willing to do so. Yep, happy to. My, my only payment is that one Saturday morning, you have to tell the construction people to turn off the beepers as they back out with their little carts. Um, that's it. That's all I got. Only one Saturday a month, and I'll be hey, totally we'll, we'll, happy. That'll, that'll, that'll happen in about a year and a half. Every <laughs> I know. I'm like, I kind of can't wait until they like start doing the inside of the building because I think like the beeping will stop at least. <laughs> I think I live probably relatively right behind you. I'm on Broadview, and oh yeah, um, and we are like, do you hear the like eerie sounds the steel makes? And yes, like, there's like a whistling that comes in the wind. It's like yeah. a house, basically. It's it is, and then the pile driving where it's like. Wait, hey, Emily, we're we're doing that for Halloween. That's, That's what I thought. That we enjoy. It's it. already <laughs> haunted. It's already haunted. You definitely made it eerie over on our side of the wind. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. Good deal. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Absolutely, and thank you for allowing me the time to explain this to you. Obviously, I'm self-interested as well since both of my children are part of this district, but um, I really do want us to be able to make good decisions for our kids. So um, yeah, let's move this forward. I'll be in touch, believe me. Okay, sounds good. I'm, I'm gonna leave now, is that okay? Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Well, I do know, um, I, I don't want to cut this conversation too short, but I didn't know, um, you, you know, that was a lot of good information, but it also leads to, um, you know, if there's any other feedback in this forum that the, that the board would like to give Andy as, as he continues to work with, with his team. Um, you know, Elizabeth is obviously a great resource for the district, but I know that Andy also continues to work with the Educational Service Center of Central Ohio has put a lot of time and resources into this sort of work recently to help out districts um, along with health departments and everybody else. So it's not, it's not a one person shop, but um, certainly this is a, one of the many great resources. So I don't know if we had any other feedback for, for Andy. I guess I have a quick question. So Andy, I know when you go through the decision-making process, one person that you might call on obviously is Dr. Root. Do you have either uh, a group of panelists that you plan on consulting or a plan to create one? Yeah, so basically what I've done at this point is um, consulted primarily with other superintendents in Franklin County to um, try and learn what they're also doing. And I've gotten two different frameworks um, from two different districts and I'm trying to morph it into uh, what, what I feel is best for Grandview uh, in consultation with primarily the leadership team in Grandview, as well as planning on sharing that with the board to garner your feedback uh, and opinions. Uh, and just do that continually and iteratively over the course of the next couple of weeks with the understanding that, um, and I think it might've been Eric that said it, but I'm not sure, even what we go to, for lack of a better word, print with 
um, with the understanding that that could change uh, as we learn and grow. I mean, you know, just think about the last six months in terms of the data that we had and what we were using and how that's changed even to today and the varying, uh, I guess, buckets of data that we are going to have now. And so how do you put that all together in a framework to help us guide our, our decision that's best for Grandview? And some of what I'm gonna share also in my superintendent's report, I think is related directly to this. And it's things like, you know, um, just for example, we, we do have a unique hybrid model um, that does bring kids into school every single day for three hours. Um, obviously, if we could bring them in uh, six hours a day, that would be better. Don't get me wrong from an academic standpoint, a social emotional behavior standpoint, but uh, our hybrid model is unique to really the Ohio, all of Ohio, certainly Franklin County. And I think it's academically uh, superior um, than, than pretty much what everyone else is doing. Um, that's my opinion. Others may disagree. Um, but th so, so that's part of the thinking. And, and, and anyway, I'll get more into it in my uh, superintendent's report. Thanks. Any other comments? One thing, Andy, and you know, I'm, I'm not sure that this is necessarily part of the decision framework, but you know, um, being a mission driven organization, you know, we, we talk about all this data and, and student safety and the safety of our community is obviously paramount and number one. So I don't want you or anybody to take what I'm saying differently than that. But, you know, I am excited that we have had our students go through the diagnostic testing, the MAP testing, um, not so much the KRA for this comparison. Uh, we have the third grade ELA test coming up. And so, um, you know, I think that we as a board are going out here, the, the impact of, you know, how are our kids doing com compared to how they've done in past years. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, that that would necessarily drive a decision or that we would certainly be careless with, uh, with the health data. But, you know, I want to be sure that, that as we look at data, that as that data becomes available and is processed with your team, you know, I, I think the board would like to continue and, and board tell me if I'm wrong and you can just send it to me, but I doubt would, would like to still, you know, hear here we, where we are and if we're seeing dips, because I think there'll be, you know, some long-term educa educational implications that we'll, we'll need to think about, whether it be extended programming in summer or whatever that looks like. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, you know, I think, you know, that that's what we can do to stay true to our mission and vision and, and, and doing what we do for kids. So I, I'd appreciate that. Uh, the typical metrics and data that we've had shared with in the past, we continue to get shared, um, you know, with us moving forward. All right. Okay, if we go on to uh, minutes at this point, we got, I could have a motion for the approval of the special meeting and regular meeting, both held on September 9th, 2020. So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Questions or discussion about the minutes? Beth? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gebhardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, building and department reports. Once again, uh, you know, I know that the entire board very much appreciates that. Um, um, getting those, it, it gives us a good sense of where we are. Are there any questions or discussions from the board for the building de and department reports provided in the packet? So I actually do, and it's of course related to COVID. Um, I, I think it was particularly a question, I think most specifically stated at the middle school, but probably a little bit into the others of um, noticing that, you know, the, the, subset of students that aren't connecting or um, aren't completing work seem to be, you know, in this model. Um, uh, you know, there's a vast range of experiences. And I think for our, 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 our experience in the spring was, you know, Grandview did a lot better than some other schools, which had, you know, a significant drop off. But I mean, there was some mention of, of some of that. Um, along with mention of doing something about it and not just accepting that. So um, just wanted to get a little better sense of both what 
uh, Andy and Jamie, maybe of what you're thinking of as um, helping us understand the extent of that and then also just what you're doing about it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the first crack and then Jamie can fill in the gaps. So um, in a general way, we were seeing a lot of um, challenge as it relates to work completion, assignments, turning them in on time, uh, getting them in. And so correspondingly, that was translating into um, grade deficits, right? And so uh, Quint and his MTSS leadership team devised a plan to address that and they created study tables for those that were getting uh, were struggling and the numbers were surprisingly large actually um, and I think that um, and Jamie can correct me she sent me an update today and um, we were we were down to something like I mean it was astronomical the difference like I want to say seven but of course I'm going to be wrong but we went from like a really large number and due to study tables in the in, in addressing and putting a spotlight on this challenge and partnering with our students we have significantly reduced that number already. Um, Jamie you want to add anything? Sure no thanks for asking that question Eric. Um, you know I think it's one of those things where we look at not only um, maintaining the integrity of a year's worth of growth, but also when you think about the adolescent brain, think about a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old, and eight periods of a day in completing work in an online and hybrid setting. Um, we met with the middle school team and they've just done phenomenal work. So I think we were upwards of like, I want to say um, 50 plus uh, missing assignments total um, when you look at the, the, the range between fourth fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then um, when we looked at like an eligibility reports and some of the metrics, we really, you know, took a deep look at some of the structural things that we could do. And then also some of the reporting pieces too. For example, um, you know, if I have an assignment in their in progress book and I, you know, haven't updated my grade book, is that populating as a lower grade for students? So we've done some things internally too and really cleaned up. So as Andy outlined in seventh grade, we had zero students that were on the ineligibility report and only three students that were on the eighth grade and eligibility point, uh, report. And then also we've been reaching out to families as critical friends to give us some feedback of what like a day in the life of a student looks like. And we're working towards some videos to be able to provide to the board to give you some more feedback of what the student experience is truly like. Um, because as Andy talked about in our hybrid model, we definitely feel like pedagogy and instructional practice is sound and that it's you know definitely a superior model but we always have to put on that lens of what it feels like for students so that's where we're trying to create more of a feedback loop with families and also through our mtss process so i'm really proud of how we've been able to again approach this as learners but then also work as a staff to be able to adjust and adapt to meet the needs for our students so i think I think we're at a much better place. We'll continue to improve, um, but that's a great question, Eric, and I'm glad that you asked it because I think one of the things that we have, you know, really held on to is this idea of making sure that our students don't lower the bar of being able to really, you know, continue to maintain the integrity of those grade level standards. Um, and as Jesse talked about, we are looking at our map data. And I'm happy to say that we didn't see a lot of regression in English language arts. We stayed static and our students maintained their skills. And we were really worried about the effect size of really missing instruction from March until August. Um, we did see a bit of a dip with math. Um, you know, it's wavering between three and four writ points, which really is not that bad when you consider the linear way that math curriculum is developed. Um, and our students have had, you know, again, a, a pause in their access to instruction. So we're looking at that data in a very normed way. Uh, MAP was uh, normed in 2015. There are new norms that are out in 2020 and our MTS teams or MTSS teams are looking at those. So I think that to your point, it's not just work completion. It's also we want to make sure that students are growing and that working collaboratively to, to make sure they're focusing on the right things. And I have to give credit to our related arts staff. You know, for many years, they've fought and advocated for the importance of a, a robust related arts program and a global languages program. And they've had to really step back and think about what's realistic as we focus on some of those core academic skills and what that feels like in a student day. And you can see that represented if you, if you have children at RLS and you see how they're really focusing on math and the literacy portions of their day and integrating the science and social studies. And then the related arts team is really working on some more interspace engaging you know, asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunities, but also 
stepping back and, and, and thinking about what's realistic for students in terms of work completion. So it is definitely work in progress, but I feel like we're continuing to learn. And I feel like our feedback loop is a really positive one that's helping us improve every day. Thanks. That's really great to hear, you know, the, the quick rapid response to that. Um, and, you know, just the monitoring of it. Um, one quick follow up question. Um, I think maybe it was you, Andy, you mentioned uh, study tables. I mean, is that literal study tables or is that like virtual tables or you know, how does that work? Yeah. Jamie. Well, I can take this. It's uh, three days a week, and it's from 845 to 945, and it's open to any student at the middle school. So, uh, you know, hats off to Adam Malley, uh, Mr. Hinkle, and Mr. and Dr. Gage for putting that together. But it's three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the Commons, 845 to 945 for any student that would like to really receive some support and have some structure for work completion or just extra homework help. But it's also a requirement for students that are missing assignments. So if you know Jamie Lusher is missing a couple of assignments in ELA, I'm going to get a nice invitation that's not optional, and I'm going to be attending study tables to, to complete that work. Additionally, I did want to just put a shout out to Eileen McNeil and Ryan McDonald at the Grandview Heights Public Library. They are working to um, incorporate a resource that will provide universal access to students for homework, help, and study support from 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. for any student in any grade level um, to be able to access one-on-one -on -one homework support. And it's a resource called BrainFuse. You may be familiar with it if you're familiar with Worthington Public Libraries and Bexley Public Libraries, but that is a work in progress right now too that our students will have access to in addition to the layers of MTSS and then the study tables of the middle school. Thanks both for all that. That's really helpful to hear. Thanks. Other questions or discussions on the building and department report? I don't know if this is the right place in the agenda or not, but I just, it seems like everything's gotten figured out with the crossing guards and whatnot. I just wanted to feel safe, especially at the middle school where it feels kind of chaotic, but we're all good there now. Yeah. So we created a safety patrol and um, those students, we, uh, and again, I hate to continue to lean on Jamie, but I know her, I believe her daughter and perhaps her son was elected, so she might be able to tell more details. But in essence, we have empowered our students as a leadership opportunity to serve as safety patrols and crossing guards. And we've got them all of the safety gear and they're on a rotating basis, AM, PM, um, and, and all of the, and we did it in collaboration with Greta and Mrs. Wheeler, um, who also serves as a crossing guard. So. Um, and I think the city is, they were really struggling with filling those positions for a myriad of reasons. And quite candidly, I think this is a win, 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 the solution that we came up with. And huge props to Sean Hinkle, showed a lot of leadership in getting that off the ground and empowering our students for this leadership opportunity to increase safety. Yep. No, I, I would just only add that, yeah, our, our uh, safety squad or safety patrol is on point starting at 740 in the morning until 805 to help students cross um, in all of those areas, uh, Fairview and Oakland. Um, there are also, I would say that Sean has done a really good job of training them, but also making sure that they're not in intersections and doing kind of what's developmentally appropriate in terms of the leadership capacity. Um, they're also there when we have our dismissal time, so they're to be on duty at um, 1055 until 1105 when students are dismissing at the break and then on point about 15 minutes before arrival um, when we have the afternoon sessions and then obviously afterwards. So uh, again, big thanks to um, all the partnership between the, the city, also uh, AAA, and then obviously Mr. Hinkle for all of his help. You know, I'm really hoping that my eighth grader can figure out how to put the belt on appropriately. That's still a work in progress. So I'll keep you posted on that. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. I, I mean, obviously, school safety is always important, but given the school construction and the Brexton project at Eddington on first, it's been a bit of a concern. So I'm glad that it's worked out the way it was. And uh, like Andy said, I do think it's a win win. So very good. Thanks. All right. Anything else under the building and department reports? All right, Beth, you're up. Okay, thanks, Jesse. I am going to share my screen. Okay, so do you guys see that? Okay, let me move it to presentation mode. Okay, so um, just for a quick update the, um, on my treasurer's report, a um, couple things I wanted to highlight. 
So first, looking at our general fund, um, we did get our second half tax settlement on um, September 25th, so just before the end of the month. Um, just as a reminder, that was delayed 45 days by the county auditor just for COVID-related reasons. Um, so this is much later than what we typically receive that. Um, and that came in at about 48% of our budget, which 52-48 split is typical um, in any given year. So usually the, the percentage is a little bit higher in the first half of the calendar year um, and a little bit under 50 um, second half. So that is um, typical and expected. Um, our state funding um, is as expected at this point. One thing I did want to point out is that our um, first casino revenue settlement is about half of what it normally is. So we're really seeing the impact of the COVID casino um, statewide closures back in the spring um, with this revenue. And, and we do have, um, you know, in the five-year forecast, we do have a provision for um, that revenue being less than, than what it typically is. So the homestead and rollback we have not received yet just because of the delay in that tax settlement. So I would expect that we get that before the end of October. <clears throat> um, with that tax settlement, we also got our Grandview Yard money from the city. And we typically look at that on a calendar year basis because the whole property tax um, cycle is based on calendar year and our projections are based on calendar year. And with that second half settlement, um, we're at about 3% over what was budgeted. So that's really good news. That revenue is coming in a little bit higher than, than what our, our projections show. And then with that too, um, the homestead and rollback on that settlement is also pending. So we do know the amount that that's gonna be, um, another $20,000. And that'll put us at about 4% um, over our calendar year project projections. So that revenue is um, continuing to, to stay strong. Interest revenue for the month um, was just over $24,000. And, <clears throat> excuse me, our expenditures were almost exactly what, what our fiscal year to date budget is. So three months into the year and we were at 25.2% um, of our budget. So right on target. Um, so moving ahead, I wanted to give a little bit more information on the, um, a little bit more of a breakdown on the Grandview Yard numbers that I was just talking about. So for calendar year 2020, um, the, the first bar on this chart shows what was projected. And as you remember, there's kind of three buckets of that revenue. Um, the first being that light blue section is um, about $2 million, and that is what helps with our general fund, um, helps paying for general operations. The dark blue section <clears throat> is the portion that we use for debt service. And then that the gold section at the top is really um, kind of, we just call it other. Um, it's so anything beyond what we need for general fund and for debt service kind of falls into this other category. And that was something that was very intentional in our, our renegotiation of the Grandview Yard Agreement. Um, in particular to help offset costs if we see increased enrollment um, from Grandview Yard um, and also to possibly to help with um, future facility issues. So looking at the actual then, you can see um, about 3.9 million total at the top of that, that bar graph. So the, the two blue sections do not change. The, the portion that goes to general fund, the portion that, that subsidizes the bond issue. And so really any, anything over or short of our projection kind of falls out in that other category. So we were about $143,000 um, over our projections for the calendar year. So moving on, um, bond retirement fund, our next bond payment, um, principal and interest of about 3.4 million. Um, will be due on December 1st. So I'll be making that at the end of November. Looking at the construction fund, um, our September interest earnings were just over $88,000. Um, and the project to date interest earnings are about a million um, $20,000. And that is the investment of the, the bond proceeds since June of 2019 when we issued those bonds. Um, soft costs were at about 46.8% spent and construction costs about 7.8%.
and our fund balance is 48.1 million. So a couple other updates I wanted to share, um, things that are on the agenda tonight. <clears throat> the first thing is um, our annual financial audit started on September 21st. We had auditors on site that day. Um, the engagement letter or the contract for that engagement is on the, the agenda for approval by the board tonight. And the, the second thing I wanted to share is um, a proposed property value settlement with 855 Grandview LLC. Um, so a little bit of background on, on what this is. Um, this property sold for $13.75 million at the end of 2019. Um, but that property is only being taxed by the county auditor at about 8.6 million. So that difference um, equals about $120,000 a year in school tax. So that's just the portion that would come to us. The, the full difference would be more than that, um, you know, for county levies and city levy and, and library levies. Um, but anyway, what we did when we saw the, that property sell for that, we filed an offensive property value appeal. So um, that goes through the Board of Revision at the Franklin County level. And that property owner actually reached out to us and asked if we would be open to a settlement offer rather than um, taking the case clear through that, that um, process. So working with our attorney, what we came up with was a proposal where immediately upon approving this agreement, um, that property owner would pay us the full $120,394 for 2020. So we would get that payment immediately. We would get another payment in 2021 equal to 100% of that tax difference. And then for 2022, we would agree to accept 50% of that difference. And then finally, we would not file a complaint in 2023. Um, beyond 2023, we do not um, make any uh, agreements. Um, that, that 2021 through 2023 is that triennial period. Um, so we're in a triennial update right now. Um, we, would be, we would be free to file or at least look at this again in 2024. So, um, so anyway, we think that's a pretty good, um, you know, compromise on this case. And, you know, it takes away some of the uncertainty of going through that, that border of revision process where sometimes the outcomes are not what we would expect. And it also um, limits attorney fees and, and time associated with, with taking this through the, that process. And with, with COVID, those cases are, um, delayed quite a bit from, from what the typical schedule would be. So this would be something that, that would not be resolved um, going through that for, for quite some time. So anyway, for a lot of reasons, we, we think this would be a positive. And, and, and we I, did, oh, go ahead, Eric. I just wanted to mention that uh, we did talk about this in the finance committee mm -hmm. and uh, thought it was a good idea. So um, uh, that has the finance committee, go ahead. Th correct. Thanks for share sharing that too, Eric. That's a good point. Um, and then the, the last thing um, that I wanted to share is just a quick overview of the five-year forecast, which is also on the agenda for tonight. Um, so just a little bit of background information, and, and most of this is, is kind of refresher information, but this is our de uh, Ohio Department of Education requirement, but more importantly, it's a tool that helps us monitor our own finances. Um, it, it really helps us track and, and plan for levy cycles and, and looking at when we need new revenue sources. And it also helps us manage cash flow and um, invest excess funds that we have. Uh, the forecast is general fund only, so it does not include grant funds. It doesn't include our PI fund or, um, you know, our athletics funds or our student activity funds, um, but just general fund only. It includes three years of historical data, five years of forecasted data. And most importantly, I think to understand is that this represents a snapshot in time and it's based on information that we know at that time. So one thing that I can say for certain is that actual results will differ from, from these numbers. Um, probably more so than ever, 
um, just operating in the, you know, with the, the whole COVID environment, um, that has probably created more uncertainty than, especially in, in our forecast, than, than what we have seen um, in recent history. So it is important to know that. Um, things are changing almost daily. Um, by the time I get the forecast done, there are already things changing that, that impact those numbers. Um, so the, I will say the Finance Committee does review and monitor this information on a, on a monthly basis. Um, and if there are significant changes, um, I will update the forecast more often than the, the two times a year that are required. Um, so, and this is something also that the Finance Committee, like I said, reviewed um, at our last meeting on September 14th. So just a couple areas um, kind of to that point of the uncertainties in the forecast. Um, like I said, COVID really has some wide reaching um, impact on, on virtually every area of our finances, whether it's, um, you know, tax revenue and state funding and, and um, tuition for kindergarten interest revenue, you know, there are just, you know, staffing levels. There, there are so many aspects of, of, um, of our finances that are impacted. And as this, um, you know, continues to, to evolve, um, you know, I would expect we're going to see more changes as well. Um, state budget, as you guys know, um, you know, we got a significant reduction last year. Um, and that was also extended to this year, to fiscal year 21. Um, the thing about the, the state budget, of course, is it's only two years at a time. Um, this forecast includes two biennium budgets that, that are in the future that, you know, we don't know what school funding is going to look like in those budgets. So there is some un uncertainty with that. There is also talk of a new, um, what they're calling a FAIR state funding formula. And, you know, the, there would be a big question about how that would impact us. Um, we're a district that's on the transitional aid guarantee to a large extent. And so we will be closely monitoring, um, you know, developments with any proposed new funding formula. So that is certainly an area of uncertainty for us. And then just the last couple things, lab labor negotiations, of course, um, our current contracts expire in 2022. So, um, you know, wages and benefits beyond that are subject to future negotiations. And then <clears throat> our Grandview Yard revenue, um, that makes up 17% of our general fund budget. And, you know, the, the continued growth in that revenue is largely dependent on how quickly that development is built out. So, um, so anyway, just a little bit of flavor there on, um, you know, some of the uncertainties and, and um, you know, why, why those things change and, and why those numbers um, change as quickly as we get this done. Um, so when I look at the forecast and when I present the forecast, what I like to focus on is what has changed since the last forecast. So the board approved a, a five-year forecast back in May. And so what I kind of want to focus on here just uh, uh, briefly is what has changed since then. So I did update property tax projections based on the triennial update. And while the, the value increase is, is fairly significant, the overall impact on our taxes is pretty minimal. Um, so about a 2% increase in taxes because of House Bill 920. Um, state funding, back in May, we knew about the, the reduction in state funding. Um, however, just about as soon as I got the forecast done, um, along came House Bill 164, which restored a portion of those funding cuts. Um, so we did not know that when we approved the, the forecast the last time. So I have adjusted the state funding numbers um, for House Bill 164. Um, Grandview Yard numbers have been updated for the 2020 projections. Um, and then some adjustments to other revenue. Um, you know, like I mentioned, all day kindergarten tuition is, is suspended um, while we're in a virtual or in a hybrid model. Um, interest revenue, um, you know, we're seeing historically low interest rates right now, and that has been impacted. And then um, building rental income. So we have various groups that, that rent our buildings and, and um, you know, since March that has not been able to, to take place. So, um, so those are the, the primary areas where adjustments have been made um, to revenue. And then just a couple 
um, expenditure items that I wanted to highlight. Um, there were several areas where I had to make some adjustments because fiscal year 20's expenses were a little bit lower than normal with school being closed for, for a fourth of the year. So, um, you know, things like utilities and, and um, substitute teachers and transportation, you know, some of those expenses were lower than typical last year. So um, I had to make an adjustment before I, I projected for this year. So you're gonna see a little bit higher um, the normal increases in, in a few of those categories for that reason. Um, under salaries, we have a, a new custodial position. Um, we had a couple FTE adjustments to existing staff. Um, under purchase services, you know, we're planning a new technology assistant position. Um, supplies, of course, PPE is the big thing this year. We did have some grant money that paid for about the first $100,000 of that. Um, but we're, we are at about 130,000 right now um, spent on PPE for this year. So, um, so that'll certainly impact um, our general fund. And then um, transfers out, we're gonna be doing um, uh, some subsidies to other funds, you know, that, that we have not had to do before or, or to the extent we've had to do before. So for example, the, the athletic fund, um, you know, athletic events have significant restrictions on um, spectators right now. And so we are not charging admission revenue. So we do expect that our general fund is going to have to subsidize the athletic fund for some, for some lost revenue. Um, food service fund, we, we typically subsidize on an annual basis. Um, I do expect it's going to be more this year than what, what it has been in the past. I am. Is it okay to ask questions sure. now? Or should yeah. I yeah, go ahead, Emily. Well, on the food service, because I was looking at the financial reports you sent us, I mean, obviously, the report that's for the food service fund, that's for the Rotary Fund, where you're taking in revenue that, you know, students and staff pay to buy lunch, but given the program where they get free lunches and breakfasts, it makes it look like there's, you know, obviously the appearance is that there's this huge negative cash balance. Um, but the reality is we're getting a federal subsidy to backfill that, correct? We are. And that's a, that's an issue with the, just the timing of when that reimbursement is submitted and when we receive that. So, um, you know, typically August and September are submitted together. And um, so, you know, Following the end of September, Kyle is likely to be submitting that, you know, any time now. And, and so we would be receiving that subsidy within the next few weeks. So, um, so it does look a little bit unusual compared to past years because we would have been collecting, um, you know, charges for those lunches, whereas this year we're not. So we will see that, but it's going to be a little bit of a delay um, compared to, 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 you know, the expenses incurred. Right. But then the idea of that is like year over year, it's not as though the district's general fund should be on the line for, for an extensive amount more than it normally would be for food service. Um, so depending on, so, so the reason why I mentioned it for this year is I think in, in a hybrid um, situation, you know, I, I think time will tell once the, the free um, lunches, you know, once that runs out, if it, if it does in fact run out at the end of December, um, you know, I think the unknown there is how many students will be buying lunch when, when they're only there for three, three hours a day. So, you know, it's something that, that, you know, we have been having conversations with Kyle and we've been working with him and, and, um, you know, as we transition between models and as the, this food service subsidy changes, um, you know, I think there is some uncertainty there. So we'll certainly continue to monitor that um, sure. and see where that goes. Well, I know Kyle's not on here, but just say it's been great. It's been great getting <laughs> my kids are in the morning. It's been awesome getting breakfast and lunch at that in between spot. But anyway, <laughs> good, good. Um, so just kind of wrapping up, you know, this is a, a stable forecast. We have a cash balance at the end of 2025. Um, equal to about 5.8 million. Um, our unreserved cash balance is about 2.2 million. So that's a real positive um, with a, with a um, forecast in, in year five. Um, there are not a lot of school districts that, that report a positive cash balance at all, um, you know, in the last year of that forecast. So, so it is a stable forecast and, 
Um, and I think that's, a, like I said, a, a very positive, um, you know, just to kind of highlight local revenue accounts for 87% of our budget. So, you know, the, the, the burden for funding our schools, um, you know, in our district rests largely on, on our local community and our local taxpayers. Um, salaries and benefits are about 77%, and that's pretty typical for um, school districts as well. So, you know, some, somewhere between 75 and 80%. Um, and then the last two slides, I just, um, I've got pie charts just to show a little bit more information about the different revenue sources and, and expenditure categories. Um, so like I said, the local revenue sources, property taxes, 67% um, of our budget, Grandview Yards, 17%, um, state funding is only 7%. Um, the Homestead and Rollback about 6% and then other revenue, um, 3%. And then finally, um, expenditure categories, um, you know, wages, benefits together are about 77. Um, purchase services are next at 12%. Uh, supplies, 5%. Um, transfers, another 5%. And other fees, 1%. So that transfers, um, that represents the, the subsidy to those other funds. And the biggest portion of that is, is what we transfer for um, debt service and to subsidize that that bond issue. So that's all I have, um, unless there are any other questions. Well, thank you, Beth, that was, that was very thorough. Any other questions on the treasurer's report as presented? If not, can I have a motion to approve the September 2020 financial reports and payment of the September 2020 bills? So, so moved. moved. Second. All right, our finance committee folks have uh, motion and seconded that. <laughs> Any other questions or discussion? Beth, you please call the roll. Mr. Bodie. Aye. Mrs. Gebhardt. Aye. Mr. Gousset. Aye. Mr. Truitt. Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth. Aye. And I think that screen is still being shared. Oh, is it? Okay. Hmm. There we go. There we go. Okay. Not Thank sure. you. Okay. All right. Next up is uh, Andy, your superintendent's report. The floor is yours. Yeah. So, uh, in in while I'm while I begin, Chris, would you pull in the uh, the principals and for, while, while I'm doing this, so that they can um, share their, how hybrid's going at, at the conclusion of this. So uh, a couple highlights. First off, um, Stevenson Elementary, 93% of our first graders, 85% of our second graders, and 95% of our third graders are on track to meet the requirements of the third grade guarantee. Uh, as, as discussed, EILMS study tables have created for students. We've created for students uh, in, during their time off and their AM, PM, uh, an hour to complete their schoolwork, which is a, a proactive measure for work completion. And we additionally, as mentioned earlier, we have the, the safety squad or safety patrol helping create a safer environment as kids uh, come into and leave our school buildings on the AM and PM uh, hybrid schedule. Um, we have two students who are named commended national merit scholars. Commended scholars are those who are in the top 3% of all PSAT test takers in a given year. Uh, so that's that's very exciting. Um, I want to also just mention that you know we're beginning to pivot to winter sports and having conversations about winter sports. And in essence, while there haven't been any final final decisions, word is that all winter sports are a go. There seem to be two sports that are in question. One is swimming and diving, and the other is wrestling. Um, so I will continue to keep you posted on that. I wanted to spend some time talking about just some, some COVID-19 general updates. So first off, I think as all of you know, I continue to meet with Franklin County Public Health as part of our Central Ohio Superintendent Association meetings each Tuesday morning to learn about positivity rates, new case rates, where we are in the color-coded system, along with just where their recommendations are. Uh, in a general way, the numbers in Franklin County uh, seem to be staying relatively static and as of October 2nd, Franklin County Public Health released a new recommendation. And in essence, their recommendation 
for districts in Franklin County was to stay in the hybrid model. Um, as all of you got to see today I've, uh, through Dr. Elizabeth Root, I've been meeting with her each Friday um, as we begin to develop our CATS specific data for Grandview Heights. Um, and so we will continue in the coming weeks to sharpen our saw on that and begin to get a framework to share um, with the board as well as our leadership team and ultimately our community. Um, As you may or may not know, there are some districts beginning to discuss returning full time. And I, I wanted to just share some of my thoughts. And I think it's important, and I, I shared some of this earlier, uh, it's, it's, it's not always apples to apples. Uh, and so as part of these considerations, we must weigh the percentage of our students that are enrolled in, a vir in our virtual Florida learning school and our ability to maintain six feet distancing because the percentage of students that are in uh, the virtual school certainly impacts if we were to pivot, for example, to an all day, every day, our, uh, that six foot distancing. So for example, Jesse mentioned rightfully so that New Albany, 30% uh, of their population is in all virtual. So we are sitting currently about 7%. Just to give you a sense, um, more nuance there. Um, additionally, our classroom square foot size are generally smaller than most other districts. And so uh, this impacts contact tracing or close contact or exposure and our ability to possibly maintain six foot distancing, which we are able to do in our current hybrid model as evidenced by the fact that we've had several positive COVID student cases. And because we're able to maintain six foot distancing, even in our hybrid, they haven't reached that threshold of uh, closer than six foot for an aggregate of 15 minutes or greater. Um, one of the other insights, so Cincinnati has, there are some districts that have returned all day, every day. And one of the things that they have mentioned in some of our uh, BASA all superintendent meetings is, is anytime someone is COVID positive, it is on average around 20 individuals due to close contact and contact tracing that have to quarantine for 14 days. I share that with you just anecdotally because their absentee rates are, have become very high and it creates this whole additional layer of disruption and challenge in terms of student, the student learning experience and makeup work and um, staff absenteeism, et cetera. Um, one of the other unique things that I do think is important for all of our considerations is that, you know, Grandview Heights, hybrid plan is, is significantly different than certainly all others in Franklin County, if not Ohio, in that we are present for school every single day, albeit for three hours that educationally, pedagogically, instructionally, that is certainly a superior model than say being in school for two days a week. Additionally, in terms of mitigation of COVID spread, one of the biggest challenges that uh, has been shared is that lunchtime period. And because we're on an AM, PM, you mitigate that lunchtime because clearly you can't eat and wear a mask. Um, so the fact that we're on that AM PM and we don't have to have kids eating lunch during the school day, it, it mitigates COVID spread. Um, I do think also just anecdotally and from my perspective, moving from one pathway to another does create stress for students, staff and families. In other words, you know, should we decide, for example, to return to an all day or move back to a distance learning model? I do worry about our having transitions back in the corresponding stress and stability or lack thereof that this would create. And it's just a factor to consider. Uh, obviously, clearly having students attend all day, every day would serve our students well, but for COVID and the safety concerns associated with it, as mentioned previously. Um, I did mention already Franklin County Public Health just released a new statement on October 2nd, basically saying that their recommendation hasn't changed and that is to remain in hybrid. Uh, my sense is that one of the big leverage points for Franklin County Public Health in keeping that recommendation is this six foot distancing and um, the corresponding spread. Uh, as mentioned, by Dr. Root's presentation. I'll be working with her and our leadership team as well as the governance team and the board 
to create a framework using the CATS data as well as continuing to use the Franklin County Public Health data uh, and other uh, boots on the ground data in terms of COVID spread with our students and staff. So at this point, I have asked each of our principals as well as our CAO and CTO to present from their perspective relative to learning and whether we are on track with meeting our intended learning outcomes for the year. Um, so with that said, I'm going to start with Angie Olam and then go to Quint, then Rob, then Chris, then Jamie. So, so Angie, uh, at this time, are you ready to share? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so when I think about what's going well, the thing that's most, I think, stands out and feels best for the staff and I is um, just the students' excitement to be at school. Um, even though we can't see their smiling little faces, you can feel their energy in the school. They're excited to be there. They're stopping me in the hallway to tell me stories about what's going on in their classrooms. Um, we all worried about what it would be like to have a five-year-old have a mask on, and um, they're doing amazing. Uh, really, no one's complaining, no one's whining, no one's fussing. Um, I'm just shocked at how well they're managing that and how much they're managing the new and different classroom setup. Um, it really doesn't seem to bother them. It seems to me like they're just happy to be at school. Um, when we talked about MAP tests and those uh, MAP tests and that help us decide who's on track and off track, I was pleased to see that our numbers are, are not much different than in previous years. Our kindergarten numbers are a little bit higher um, than normal, but um, as far as, you know, the on track, that is, it was surprising that the numbers were not at all, um, I didn't see a huge regression there. Um, also, I would say all the protocols that Amy Elliott and our new nurses aide has set up has been flawless. Um, the kids have two different color passes. If they just need a Band-Aid or sometimes they need chapstick or, or they've had an accident, um, they use a green pass. And then um, if they have COVID-like symptoms, then they come in with a red pass and we isolate the room right away. And we've been taking kids out um, a different door so we're not infecting lots of areas. So that has run very, very smoothly. Um, and Amy Elliott is, and uh, Tracy Thompson, who works in my, in the, at Stevenson, are so easy to work with and so great to kids. So that has been a great uh, transition for me to have a new nurse and a new nurse's aide, and they're both amazing. Um, and then something that we talk about as a staff, and you know, Jamie mentioned it earlier, something we're still continuing to work on is that balance for families. Um, some families say there's not enough um, work for when the kids are at home. Other families say there's too much. So we're still trying to gauge what is just right for families. So we're gonna been talking to kids about what is right. And you know, it does depend when they're little, they need, um, parent support. And I totally understand that many parents are working. And so we're trying really hard to find that balance for families. Um, I think that's all I have. Excellent. Thank you, Angie. Um, Quint? Hello. Um, I guess I, I want to start with kind of what's going well. And I echo a lot of Angie's uh, sentiments there. Uh, I guess, first of all, off, I want to say how proud I am of the staff. Uh, they're really working hard for the students in the community. They've really stepped up. And uh, I think everything is going great in our virtual mode. Um, in personal, in person learning is going very well as compared to our, our virtual learning. I think uh, everyone was excited to make that transition. It was like a, you know, a second first day of school. Uh, and now we're, we're getting to see the benefits of that. Um, the, the teachers say that smaller group sizes uh, in the hybrid mode translate to more individualized attention and better outcomes for students. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a positive of our hybrid model. Um, we have fewer disruption and off task. Uh, you know, students are basically coming in, they're doing their learning and they're, and they're going. There's not a lot of time for disruption when you've got fewer than 10 kids in the class. Um, we feel like the physical distancing protocols are going very well 
and again, kudos to the nursing staff and, and all the, um, the paraprofessionals and the custodians who are, are cleaning at lunch. Uh, everyone's feeling very safe uh, based on our procedures that we've been doing. Um, we've been really establishing uh, cultures of learning in the classrooms and clear expectations for safety, uh, and we continue to move forward in that. Um, again, I also want to want to say that the AMPM model is very good, especially for the younger kids. Um, I think it's super important to see them every day. Uh, the schedule is much more consistent. Um, they're able to take, you know, leave their masks on all day. We're not uh, eating in the school, which makes everything a lot safer. And uh, I guess what we're what we are also needing and to improve is that balance uh, that Angie spoke of too. We are seeing that some students are kind of coming in the morning or coming in the afternoon, and when they're not there, they're acting like it's a day off of school where, you know, we we are still expecting some um, asynchronous kind of learning. So that's one of the things that we used uh, the study tables to address. We've seen a big uh, impact there, and we're going to continue to monitor that. Um, um, family and parent communication has been very extensive. So we've been spending a lot more time kind of communicating with families and, and, and students. Um, and then based on uh, whether we're going to get a year's growth or in a year's time, that's something that we're really looking at. Um, some classrooms, some content areas lean a little bit more to um, asynchronous learning, English, language arts, and social studies. You know, they can introduce a concept, a student can take it and run with it. Math and science is a little bit trickier where, you know, each unit builds on the other. And uh, so we're just, we're, we're waiting to see kind of how, how we are uh, able to address that moving forward. Um, a lot of, a lot of teachers said that that mid-year map score might be a very telling point of uh, data that we might need to look at uh, to progress monitor kind of how the, the whole building's doing in January. So I think that's all I have. Excellent. Thanks, Quinn. And we will, if you guys have questions, let's, let's let the principals go and then you guys can ask if you'd like. Uh, Robert. Hello, everyone. Um, it's going to seem like I was looking off of uh, Quentin Angie's paper, but I really wasn't. I, I just happened to agree with, with both of their assessments of how it's going so far, um, starting with re really the excitement of the students, even at the high school level. You know, a lot of us spent a lot of time in the spring and even the first part of this year with remote learning, um, focusing on students' social, emotional learning, their mental health, being very worried about their mental health, quite frankly. Um, and now in hybrid, they're, they're just so happy to be back with their teachers and, and just forming those relationships, which is so hard to do in remote learning. Um, and teachers have, have done a great job really reshaping and rethinking what, what their content area looks like, what the curriculum looks like in sort of this hybrid model and just rethinking how they do things um, and reorganizing. And I think we're really hitting our stride and, and it's going really well. Um, we, we saw some similar issues with with you know, work completion, especially for students who, you know, there, there's always a, a segment of, of student who has a difficult time doing things at home in a given year, homework, studying, whatever it is. And, and I think that's just amplified when, you know, half of your learning is at home. Um, and so we're, we're really finding different ways to mitigate that and help students. And, you know, as an example, we're, we're now using sort of that lunch period where we can help students and have test retakes. And, and support from teachers. Whereas the first couple of weeks of hybrid, we were so, and we're still focused on cleaning and sanitizing, that is our priority. But the first couple of weeks, we wouldn't let students in the building at all during that period of time because we wanted to make sure we had a system in place before we started doing that and um, seeing where we could have students and, and that sort of thing. Um, we're having students stay during their study hall. You know, students are encouraged to leave during study hall because our numbers are so large. We just can't accommodate, you know, a 40, kids study hall, even in hybrid, you know, the numbers are that large. And so students can leave. But if you have missing work, we're, we're now looking at prioritizing who's staying and where they're staying and getting them help with teachers individually. Um, I lost my place. So in terms of growth, you know, we don't have map data, like like some of the lower grades, but you know, in talking with teachers, you know, a lot of them are, are either at or maybe a few days a week behind where they normally would be in, in their curriculum. 
Um, some of our AP honors courses that move a little faster, you know, they've had to get a little bit more creative and, and <laughs> offer a little bit more support for students. Um, a lot of our summative test scores are very similar to what you'd see in a typical year. Um, again, that work completion is, is definitely an issue that, that we're trying to tackle. Um, an interesting number that we have is, is our attendance numbers are outstanding. You know, um, our tardies are 92% better than they were at this time last year. Um, and our overall attendance of students attending school is 52% better. And as we really dig into that, we attribute some of that to, you know, the half day model where students in the past that, you know, some of our students just really have a hard time coming to school and some of it's social anxiety, whatever the case may be, um, you know, six, seven hours is a long time. But right now when they're staring down three hours, they say, you know, I, I can do that. I, I can come for three. Um, and I think that's having a huge impact on on our attendance. So been been very pleasantly surprised with that. Excellent. I Robert, could, thank you. If I could echo Rob really quick, one of my favorite stories this school year is a first grader who sometimes has really has behavior issues. And he's done phenomenal. And I said, How is school this year? And he said, great. And I said, do you really love your teacher? And he said, well, she's okay. I said, then why is school so great? And he said, it's two hours and 45 minutes. I can keep it together that long. So he's six and he was able to pinpoint exactly how he felt about the shorter day. So it has been a success for some of those kids who have a hard time keeping it together for six hours. Well, we're within 20 minutes of this meeting being two hours and 45 minutes, and I'm going to have a hard time keeping it together that long. <laughs> and, and, and Robert, I would only say, as a father of three sons, one of them uh, struggles with that notion of independent learning and self-discipline. Chris, you're up. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Um, so never in my career have I ever felt so essential. I'll just say that with all of this going on. Uh, you know, obviously tech has, has just, you know, it, it, it kind of intertwines everything. It's really been the hub for a lot of what we do. Um, and I just, you know, I, first off, hats off to the entire team that I have, Matt, Emmanuel, Lisa, uh, Mark Jessica, Jamie uh, McClary, all, everybody's really stepped up. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with everybody, and it's believe me, it's it's been long hours, long days, nights, weekends, past midnight, a lot of times, um, just trying to get everything, uh, you know, keep everything up and running. So it's it's been phenomenal, um, and and it's I, I'm I'm happy that we're kind of on the downward slope a little bit here. Um, absolutely, the uh, you know part of the part of the reason is because of technology has been uh, so essential. Um, and as some of you know, I, I think uh, at least three of the board families, uh, you know, have directly seen tickets in our queue um, dealing with device repairs because we have issues with, with uh, you know, devices or logins or, or those essential functions that uh, teachers need, that students need. Um, so we're, we're tackling those as quickly as possible and we've completely reformatted how we address those and the tools that we use to address those. Um, you know, because of that, we've had to adopt new tools. Florida Virtual Academy would be, you know, one of those things that we've, we've had to adopt. We've adopted additional hardware, um, and all of that requires configuration uh, and upkeep, um, being that it's, it's so essential. So, um, you know, uh, as, as we've worked through this, uh, Mark and Jessica have done a fantastic job of working with our teachers, uh, you know, using Zoom, using Google Meet, um, using all the tools uh, and integrations that we are using with students, whether they're at home or in the classroom. Um, and so, honestly, uh, we couldn't have done it with, without a team approach, and, and that's kind of where we are right now. Um, just in general, some statistics, uh, you know, this time of year, we've kind of settled into a groove typically, and we're sitting around typically somewhere between 30, 40 tickets in our queue that, that we tackle on a daily basis. We really have struggled to get under 150 tickets, and so our, we, we've, we've been delayed on trying to address some of that stuff. So, you know, I, I feel a lot of uh, empathy for our, our staff and our students. Um, that we know them and having issues, but we've been doing our best to address those. Uh, one of those is, is being directly, you know, added right now, which, which, uh, you know, uh, our, our treasurer um, just spoke about adding a tech position through the ESC, and we're adding a temporary tech position to support that because all the added devices and the added essential functions of those and all of the support requests, uh, the additional, um, you know, staffing to help us address that is really going to help us meeting the needs of the staff and students in a much faster, 
uh, more relative approach so that they're not having to wait, you know, till the end of the day if they have a problem or sometimes it's, it's the next day or the day after before we can actually dig in and address it. Because sometimes the problems are easy um, that you can solve in a few minutes and sometimes it takes, you know, a couple hours of investigation because um, we are supporting, uh, you know, a hundred different applications uh, that are used various in various positions around the district. And so uh, it stretches us a little thin to have that knowledge base and be able to work with all those vendors in order to make all of that run smoothly. But with that, that's just a quick gist of what we've been doing. It honestly has been a lot of fun because I, like I like the chaos a little bit. Um, but uh, everybody, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat what uh, we've already heard from the principals, uh, I've just been amazed at how well everybody has handled um, you know, the pandemic, moving to a hybrid approach. And you know, as, as a former teacher myself, I, I just keep telling everybody that it's, it, it, isn't it such a, a gift that we all get to be a first year teacher again? Because that's what I, I think we all feel like. Well, f first off, Chris, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with you now uh, in Marysville and Grandview, and I always considered you essential. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jamie, you want to uh, bring us home? Sure. I'll just reiterate, you know, what um, Chris and all the principals said. It's uh, been a true, you know, opportunity as a team for us to spend, you know, months and months planning and, and thinking about the implementation of what a hybrid and the pivot would be to fully online. And so, right, wrong, or indifferent, the fact that we started the year out fully online and created a systematic approach that was effective and offering high quality instruction to students. And then we're able to pivot as an organization to a hybrid model and it took courage, it took the support of our board to be an outlier and to really, you know, decide that that was the wall we were going to put our ladder on and do what we thought was best for kids. And um, we're seeing that. And my yellow lab's excited about it too. Georgia, stop. Um, so I would just say a couple of things. Right now with Florida Virtual, I, we have 70 students in program and we are looking at transition. We have some families that are going to transition back to hybrid uh, because the nine weeks is approaching and we'll start that second nine weeks uh, next Monday. We have some families that are considering transitioning uh, just because of some health concerns, some medical issues to Florida Virtual. So we're working through that. Um, you know, to Chris's point, it was an opportunity for us to look at our media center specialists. So we were able to house basically a school within a school that I'm, you know, supporting. But then we have these two media center specialists that are essentially been repurposed to offer this opportunity for our students. So we're continuing to monitor that. Um, as Angie alluded to, we did uh, administer the math assessments to our students and we are doing that data analysis now comparatively from the longitudinal data that we have from years past. Um, the other piece that we are looking at obviously is the long-term sustainability in terms of interventions and supports for students. So you heard Dr. Gage talk about the possibility of getting a data point in the winter to see where students are, to see if they're recapturing that growth, and then being intentional about our instruction um, when you think about the release of responsibility. So asynchronous learning in terms of English language arts versus a math science experience, and then just monitoring our scope and sequence. So you heard Rob talk about what that looked at the high school level and making sure that we're on pace for students who've had that exposure um, to those what we consider to be you know most dense con content areas like our AP courses. So when I say to you this is truly a team you know, effort from top to bottom, I don't want to get in the weeds of it, but from the KRA, which is the pre-K, all the way to our college board data that we're looking at, we're thinking about this iteratively and daily and then the long-term planning pieces as we think about how we can support our students. Um, but I would say this, I would say, you know, um, our teachers have just been phenomenal. Um, if you ever believed in the value of research and understanding the importance of building based leadership, our principals have just worked tirelessly to make sure that our students are safe. I mean, you need but walk around our campus and see them out there making sure that kids are feeling welcomed and loved and um, and the kids are happy to be here. And so um, we're going to try to do our very best to make sure that we don't lower that bar in terms of where they can go this year, but it will look and feel different. Um, I think the one thing that we've charged ourselves with as an organization, as we've done the work planning piece as part of our continuous improvement plan, is not to lose sight of the opportunity and the innovation that this pandemic has given us as an organization. This board meeting, this collaboration of two plus hours would not have happened six months ago, well, seven, eight months ago. Um, the opportunities that we have for students and being able to apply their learning in synchronous and asynchronous ways would not have happened prior to this experience. So what we're really trying to do is make sure that we're still 
cultivating and holding on to some of those high yield pieces that are actually really positive implications of this pandemic and being able to make sure that we can maintain those as opportunities to continue to grow and improve as an organization. So I would just thank our team top to bottom. I would thank our board for their leadership, certainly Andy for the tireless uh, hours that you put in just in helping us navigate how best to move forward as an organization to keep our kids safe because obviously that's priority one and I know it sounds cliche, but you cannot get to blooms right until Maslow's is intact and we've been focused so much on Maslow's and making sure that kids are safe. But as we've tried to transition to learning, we never wanted to lose that as our most important feature in the function of our work. So thank you. Thank you. And just how fortunate am I uh, to be able to work with such amazing, such an amazing leadership team. And, you know, uh, we all bring different strengths uh, to the table, but uh, I can't think of a finer team that I have had the privilege to work with. Um, I mean, just truly remarkable people who care deeply about kids, uh, who are growth minded and respectful of varying opinions of one another. And when we come together while there's dissension at the end of the day, we're able to, uh, the outcome is far greater than it would be because of the collective efficacy of us all. Um, so as evidenced by all of what they said. So thank you for sharing questions for any or all of them. Can I just say, well, first of all, thank you all for what you have to say and what you've been doing. Um, I know for my family, this has been an overall positive experience given what we've had to go through. Um, I would reiter reiterate what Jamie was saying in that I think the tendency at the outset was to focus on what we were losing here. But if you really think about it, there's been a lot of things we've, been, we've gained through this. I know for my kids, the individual attention for smaller class sizes has allowed some um, you know, confidence to bloom um, that I don't know would have gotten there as quickly without a class size of you know, whatever it is, eight, nine, 10. Um, and also some of the things we've talked about with personal responsibility and self-motivation. It's a hard lesson right now for these kids, but I wonder, you know, if this will really serve them well moving forward to college when you don't have somebody who's like forcing you to come to a study table early on. Um, you know, that in the end, a lot of these things might actually cause some personal growth that's really great. So, like Jamie said, I hope we can hold on to that and appreciate that. Um, one thing I did want to, to question was for the, the kids, obviously, academic. We're, we're very focused on that. And the social and emotional piece, just simply by being at school for half a day is being addressed in some way, shape or form. But it is different because they can't interact in the same way that they did before. You know, there is no lunch, there's no recess. Um, the kids can't work in small groups the same way they could. So how are we addressing the fact that they can't do those things the same way they could? Does someone want to take that? I will, um, or I can only speak for Stevenson, but I think um, another unintentional consequence is I have looked out my window and teachers are taking them outside. It's not the exact same recess they had before, but I um, was in my office yesterday and I uh, was watching uh, Mrs. Burkholder um, play noodle tag with her kids. And I don't know whether Mrs. Teach was trying to walk and play Simon Says at the same time, but it was rather comical to see. So they are getting out, they are getting outside for a break. It's, it's not exactly um, like the old recess, but they, they are getting outside. And then our, the Stevenson staff is, is just working on trying to build those community um, feelings and relationships through we're still doing morning meetings, we're still sharing, we're still doing those things, and they are working in small groups with the teacher. So it's not exactly the way it was before, but we used to have STEM bins in the morning. Teachers have created their own personal, um, so every child has like their own little STEM. It's more like a sandwich bag than a bin, but um, we're still trying to do some of those things for kids, and I do um, think, think it is working. I know also just little things I'm trying to do, like with morning announcements, we're um, using Thursdays as thoughtful Thursdays, and it's been interesting. I've shared techniques for feelings and how to show gratitude and those types of things, and I've had some kids develop their own um, 
service learning projects that they're doing in their neighborhood. So I do think it is different. I 100% agree, but I do think we are still trying to get to those social and emotional needs by doing some creative recesses and those types of um, creative recesses and, and morning meetings and just still trying to stay connected and, and let them be kids and let them still play. At the high school, we we have um, we still have that sense of community and some sense of normalcy because most of our clubs are still running. Um, and if you're if you're at the school after hours right now after three p.m., you'll see our our new theater director working with the fall play kids. And we still keep it to under ten, and they have masks, and we're following all those rules. But um, the, the kids are fine with that. They'll 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 do whatever you ask as long as they can be in person and do something they'll they'll stand on their head for a while if, if you want them to sports are, are full go they've they've gone well um we've even been able to follow all the guidelines and still have somewhat of a student section they're all spaced out they're sitting on x's but it's it's quite entertaining because they don't move they don't say a whole lot they just they're focused on sitting on that x but they really enjoy being there so keeping the clubs. And I think one of the reasons our teachers are so exhausted is they're, they're spending so much energy creating those active and engaging lessons um, with all of the barriers that you just mentioned where you can't really have that group work and you can't do a lot of the things that you would typically do, but they, they are creating new things. And I, I even saw a class today that was doing group work in the classroom, but they were doing it um, through their computers remotely, but they were still able to talk from a distance. It was I'm not doing it justice, but it was it was very creative and kids were very engaged. And I, I would echo all that. Um, you know, they are leveraging the technologies that we have. Um, you know, what used to be a small group setting turns into more of an individualized, um, you know, project for, for students. I'm thinking about uh, fourth graders for studying landforms and where you might have had three kids around the table kind of pouring the uh water into the sand and watching the erosion uh every kid had their own so it's having that smaller group is able to, uh the the teachers and the students are able to concentrate more on their own learning and don't have to share because the the class sizes are so small i would only add you know we we do have a full-time mental health specialist in amber nichols as well as the continued full-time fde with centero and our school counselors are continuing to do their, their respective groups that they have in past years as well, just anecdotally. Thank you for all you guys are doing. I know this isn't, hasn't been easy, but I really do think that it's going quite well for Grandview. And I know for my kids, um, it's, it's all together a success, so thanks. If I could just say one thing, Emily, um, we've talked with counselors and I think you know, when the kids walk through our doors, it's really easy to touch base with them and kind of see what their mood is and what the weather is just in terms of their emotional well-being. And so one of the things that we've talked about is what are our kind of ability to be able to touch base with kiddos that like on paper look like they're doing okay, but are completely overwhelmed and high levels of anxiety. We have a lot of kids who have a strong academic press who are super type A who check their progress book pages repeatedly almost to like an OCD kind of piece. And so on paper, those kids are going to be flagged. But if they were walking through our doors, we'd be able to be able to put a safety net in place for those kids. So that is something that we've talked about with our counselors is how do we touch base with, you know, students and families just to make sure that kids are okay, even on paper when it seems like they're successful, because that's the data point that we sometimes are, are not able to quite put our finger on when we aren't seeing them on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of just that connection with our MTSS process. So I know that is a focus point in one area where we feel like we are a bit hindered in being able to make sure that we have our pulse on every child that walks through our door. So I know like I met with Abby Malley last week at the middle school and she's flagged just three or four kids that she feels like maybe have some of those um, propensities to be like a high level of anxiety kiddo who might be struggling with just the workload and making sure that they're managing everything because it is a transition. So um, we'll keep you posted on just, you know, if we see any, I don't want to say trends, but there has to be a residual impact on uh, what we would consider like the mental health pieces of our kids being able to navigate this new normal, right? And so for some of our kids that come to school early that work with a teacher or that have a, a routine in place, that routine has been unsettled. So I would say that in terms of our student services piece, they're sort of on high alert 
to any of those kinds of kids that, that maybe meet that profile, if that makes sense. So that would just be one kind of like example of this new normal and what we're trying to make sure that we don't miss any data points for those types of kids. Any other questions or for discussion for our uh, principals and educational leaders? On behalf of the board, thank you. Um, that was uh, uh, very useful and meaningful for us to, uh, to hear that, um, for sure. Well, if we'll move on, any other questions for Mr. Kopp on his uh, superintendent's report? All right, then let's uh, move into the action items of the agenda. Um, board policy, we have uh, a list of policies for final reading. These were at a first reading on our last board meeting agenda. So if I could ask uh, for a motion to approve A1, A through W. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, questions or discussion? Beth, can you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gebhardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Um, we have 18 items under business and finance, uh, including your packet that does include the five year forecast that Beth presented, the property value settlement uh, that was presented. Uh, if I could have a motion for business and finance B1 through 18. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, any questions or discussions on those 18 items? I, I just did have, um, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling here, but I think it was, it was one of the um, uh, uh, academies or, or the um, the alternate learning set, uh, settings. And it looked like there were three separate contracts um, that I couldn't quite tell why we had three separate ones. Um, it's the Bonner Academy ones, right? I think. Yes, I believe so. Because they're all Buckeye Ranch affiliated, but different. I don't want to speak out of turn, but I believe, uh, you know, those are a function of, of students' individual IEPs and the services probably vary per student. So I think that we have actually a contract that aligns to that and that individual student information is redacted from the packet that the board has. Is that correct? Yes. So, so Jess, we have I'll just say one more thing about that question. I think I can speak to there were an, initially, if you looked at the packet, there were three copies of Buckeye Ranch contracts in the appendix, but only two on the face of the agenda. So um, I think that was corrected in the new upload today um, on the website. So there are, just to clarify, there are two individual contracts um, for Buckeye Ranch. And that's because there are two different students that are getting services? Yes. Okay, thanks. I was just confused by that. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions or discussions? Beth, call it. Or... Mr. Bode? Aye. Mrs. Gebhardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Um, under personnel, we have 11 items. Um, the, uh, the typical contract changes and then also um, information for uh, Kids Club that includes their work calendar. So if I could have a motion for C1 through 11, please. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Questions or discussions on personnel items one through 11? Um, sorry to have another question. Um, for the, I, I thought I had seen something that was, uh, and I think maybe you'd mentioned it earlier, Andy, the winter, winter sports are um, under the assumption that they're going forward, but there was some question about wrestling and where that stood. And I saw that there were a number of wrestling contracts. Um, so is this something that 
we are comfortable now with the uncertainty of whether wrestling is going forward or not, or has that question been answered, or does that affect the contracts, or just how does that fit together? So I don't have anything definitive or declarative. I do have, um, on good authority, uh, as recently as this morning, um, that wrestling is supposedly a full go. From OHSSA. Now, does that, can I guarantee that? No. Is it subject to change? Yes. Um, but, you know, I, I think the right thing to do at this point, given what I heard this morning um, from some several reliable resources, uh, sources that, that wrestling is going to happen. And would you happen to know when that starts up? Like, so at, would, we would have to make a decision this meeting in order for it to start on time? Starts late, late October. Okay. Early November, the latest. Same with on the flip On the flip side, uh, you know, I guess maybe to ask the question sort of backwards, you know, if, if we would, um, you know, approving the contracts allows the coach to start. If in fact the season doesn't exist, yeah. then they're not. Yeah. So we, we you know, we, we've got precedent for that um, as well. Um, I think I think our, our past precedent was 50%, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Thank you. You've answered the questions. Any other questions on personnel 1 through 11? If not, Beth, will you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. Ms. Wassman. Aye. Um, last action item on the agenda is for the recommendation for a delegate and alternate for the uh, OSBA Capital Conference. Um, in all seriousness, uh, Molly, I know you've done this for a while before. I didn't know if you even wanted, uh, you know, if we want to explain to Kevin and Emily sort of what that looks like. Um, if you're interested in doing it, that's awesome. <laughs> but I don't want you to feel like you have to. You are? She's good at it. Um, would anybody um, have an interest in being the alternate? Or have any questions about what that entails? I, I, re I looked at the dates. I'm available to be an alternate. Okay. Well, then I would make the motion for uh, Molly to be the delegate and Kevin to be the alternate for the 2020 Capital Conference. Uh, on behalf of this board. Is there a second to that? Second. Any questions or discussion? All right, thank you, you two. That is a important designation. So I know we, we sort of joke about it at times, but it, it's good to have that. Uh, Beth, can you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. Ms. Wasma? Aye. Okay, any other items for discussion from the board? Um, I do not believe we have any need for executive session. Is that correct, Mr. Call? All right, then I will take a, uh, mo you know, these board meeting links are a lot like that COVID data, right? <laughs> 30 minutes, 30 minutes, three hours. Um, I could have a motion for adjournment at 9.53 p.m. So moved. Oh, second. All right, Beth, can you please call the roll? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gebhardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. Ms. Wasman? Aye. Well, thanks to everyone. That was honestly a lot of a lot of good discussion and time well spent. So everybody have a good evening. My kids will be tired tomorrow, Angie. It's morning, yeah. <laughs>